like you know we say as christians we say all truth is god's truth and so i just tried to find out how is what these psychologists talking about how is this god's truth too <laughs> i thought it would be really interesting to actually look at how john piper talks about it hmm. and how we can look at it now or talk about walking on eggshells right i mean yes. you you wonder why yes. his why his son is like this outspoken atheist now think about the kind of pressure that puts mm -hmm. it on you to to police, to micromanage your your thoughts and your words all day long, so that you're you're not displeasing to the Lord. I mean, if you take it very far, you end up having almost a certain kind of schizophrenia. Like I don't deserve to be feeling that happy without God. Take taking the time to really believe yourself that that's what's happening, to believe that that's your what you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. But it's like, wait, are you glorying in your shame, or are you just being human? All right, hello hey everyone. Welcome to uh, another episode of Nikopod. Um <laughs> This is kind of funny. So yeah, we have a uh, <laughs> be good. Uh, me, Albert, uh, Kay, and uh, we have Jaywit on today. Mm -hmm. So uh, everyone, isn't that uh, a bruiseless? That's a bruiseless Albert. Can let's see the neck, man. <laughs> yeah, you wanna? It's a Rats. it's a bruiseless or nearly. It's healing a lot. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of hard to make it out now, actually. Mm. Mm -hmm. kind of see great, there. great, yeah. great news. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm healing. I'm uh, regaining my energy week by week. Uh, I still have some more recovery, but um, I'm definitely a lot better than I was. So thank you, everyone, for your thoughts, your uh, non prayers. And. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had to the say good that. vibes. No, the good vibes. Thank <laughs> mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Yes, um, I, I've appreciated every single comment that you guys have said. Yeah, so, I think I think you just coined something, Brady. There, we're going to just say send send us some vibes, man. <laughs> send us. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Good uh, vibes. So for today, uh, we're going to talk about a subject that uh, I think we've all talked about indirectly, mm. uh, without really addressing straight away. Um, and it's uh, the whole idea of Christianity and its impact on mental health. Um, and I think, you know, even when we've kind of sort of addressed it, and, and I know that a lot of people here, you know, have, you know, we were addressing people that are either on the fence or have, you know, or deconstructing, you know, um, and, and even Christians, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of our audience. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like this is a topic that isn't discussed enough. Uh, you know, hmm. I, I don't I don't know about the what you guys think as well, but um, I know that you know for people who have some experience with uh, therapy, um, even being on certain discussion boards like RFR. Um, what you know, is RFR? They, uh, recovery from religion. Recovering from religion. Um, okay. Yeah. From religion. There you go. Hmm. And you know, on, on those kind of boards hmm. and meetings, you know, they, they do talk about this a lot. So I, I know, you know, some of you have probably have some experience with that, but, uh, but I think, you know, it just my, my general, you know, perusing through the internet, mm. uh, even on YouTube, I, I actually can't find a whole lot of content on this. So mm. um, and, any thoughts you guys have uh, on, on this at all, or the subject of mental health? Um, I have a few thoughts. I'm just going to share a couple um screenshots I took. I think if you scroll through our, the comments under our videos, you'll see people talking about the impact of believing um, post-faith, the impact that they, like, you don't realize it while you're in it. It's only when you come out and look back that you realize yeah. how much of an impact it had on the way you saw yourself, the way you saw the world. And uh, I'll just share these two screenshots. Somebody posted this one underneath one of our uh, videos it's from San Alt Delete says, thanks for keeping me sane. I'm not doing well mentally. Take care of y'all's mental health. And this was just a video that we had talking, I, I forget what the actual uh, video was, but you know our videos, we're just talking, we're processing deconstruction, uh, deconstructing the faith, we're processing deconversion. And this person just chimed in and said, watching these videos is helping keep me sane. And 
in our surmise, I think part of that is we look for third party confirmation for what's real. Like, am I seeing this? Am I seeing this right? And if you live in a world where you're surrounded by people who are telling you that the, what the Bible says is true and, you know, depending on how literally they take it, they may try to press that, the truth of the reality the Bible paints. And you stop seeing things that way. You could feel like, man, is it me? Am I losing my mind? Um, this person said, you got to help him keep me sane. And I'll share one more. Uh, this is from uh, Jamal Luke. So somebody on one of my uh, Facebook posts just the other day asked me, who is who am I helping by always coming on line and critiquing the idea of God or critiquing the Christian faith? Who am I helping? And this brother, Jamal Luke, uh, a deconvert from Christianity, says to the person who made that comment, it has plenty of fruit, brother. I'm extremely helped by what Brady's doing. Some of us were so indoctrinated in that, in the bullshit that we need help knowing we're okay to trust ourselves and what makes actual sense to us now. The same way you go to church to reinforce your beliefs in the Bible. Also, this is social media and you know, you're basically, you're free to consume whatever you want. But people are just chiming in and saying, hey, it matters that people speak out because it's helping the rest of us stay sane or at least feel that we're sane because we're not the only ones thinking this. So this topic is not without merit. I think it's well um, long overdue. Mm -hmm. David, yeah, any thoughts? Agreed. Yeah. No, I ag agreed. I think... I think that's said pretty well by the two of you guys. Yeah. So I I think what's great about, you know, not only what um I guess I'd like to say that we're we're fostering a community with uh Ikapod. Um, you know, there there are other communities out there as mm -hmm. well. And and I, I I feel really fortunate to be having been able to cultivate this with all of us. So mm. um and I think that's definitely one step towards healing and um finding you know solace and people like you know i'm sure other, other people in the audience that you can identify with us to some degree right mm -hmm. so um and that really helps and seeing all the comments out there about people talking about their own uh, individual experiences and how it's impacted them now i think that we have seen plenty of evidence that people are suffering, people are having struggles, challenges, mm -hmm. um, especially leaving the faith. And it's not, you know, obviously we're not talking about just people who just leave the faith and therefore they're struggling with, you know, well, what do I do now? Or mm -hmm. uh, who do I talk to? But it's also how they're looking back on it mm -hmm. and processing that right through, this is what we do. So that kind of leads to the question. So, you know, does, I guess the question I want to ask is, does Christianity have problems with addressing mental health as a whole, right? If we're seeing so many people come out of this thing and hmm. they, you know, the, the, the negative emotions outweigh the positive ones. Hmm. Does it? Hmm. Hmm. Go ahead, Jay, but... No, go ahead. No, no, I'm listening. Well, I'm just thinking. So I think I may have talked about this a few weeks ago yeah. um, when I was out with uh, the brother Dayton, uh, Christian rapper. Um, we, you know, had a chance to sit down and talk about me leaving the faith and him keeping the faith. One of the first questions he's had for me was, he said, I see you online talking about the psychological effects of believing, but he was like, I can't think of any, like, what are, what are the psychological effects? And I kind of went down bit by mm. bit like he said but bro i don't see that like for me like i'm i love my my life i love my da -da -da. and i said but see that's because you're still in if you had to step out and look back you would struggle because as a believer you don't realize this yeah you probably love yourself but you know why you love yourself you've adopted this mindset that tells you you're you're lovable in Christ. God loves you for Christ's sake. Everything valuable about you is in Christ. And so as a believer, it's almost like an abusive relationship. The person breaks you down, you know, the, the negging technique. 
He negs somebody by, I'm going to just give you all kinds of negative comments, but then give you a, a positive one. So you become dependent on me for your value. And I think Christians don't realize that that's what ha what's happening. You're told you're sinful. You're told you're, you know, your righteousness is filthy rags. You're told you can't trust yourself, lean not to your own understanding. All these things you're told. And you feel so bad about yourself, but then, but God loves you and God's got a plan for you and God da da da. So yeah, you feel good about yourself while you're in it, but that good feeling is dependent on you staying plugged in to the source that made you feel like shit. <laughs> and exactly. so, um, yeah, I, I, you're you're talking about does Christianity have a problem addressing mental health? I think Christianity has a problem causing poor mental health, but because it also sells the solution, you don't realize it while you're in. That's my two 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 cents about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like like a lot of forms of abuse, and yes, I use the word abuse, one is usually not aware of the full extent of the severity of the abuse yeah. until they right. until they're out of it, then they can look retrospectively on it. Yeah, objectively. More, yeah, more full orbed understanding of what was going on. And yeah, for sure. Yeah, and, and I, I think you know, at least I can speak to that personally, right? You know, I, I'm sure that both of you guys can speak to that in your own way, like where, you know, it's not until the winders came off that you'd start to see how elaborate, hmm. how elaborate the, the, the abuse is, I guess, the, you know, coming from not only the doctrinal aspects of the faith, but um, how the culture, uh, you know, I guess, in a way, feeds into it in this in, in that kind of feedback loop um mm -hmm. for me uh, for me uh, the long yeah go ahead no i don't want to cut you off oh no you no you can cut me off because I, I do want to go into a bigger thing with this point a little bit but yeah you could yeah you could hopefully this won't be too much of an excursus but just yeah. the, the idea the fact that you guys are looking at this in terms of pathologies in general has made me just have the thought this is just incidental that it it's interesting that most believers I've run into to don't have a sense of survivor's guilt, given what many of them believe. Mm, right. Um, because if you actually believe the scriptures to say that there's going to be this large number of damned people and that they've, in a sense, escaped it by virtue of God's grace and mercy, in any other situation where that kind of thing happens, the pathology tends toward a sense of survivor's guilt. So I just think it's interesting. I don't know. It was just an observation. Well, I, I think but anyway. as a believer, I would say I wouldn't feel the survivor's guilt until that reality kicked in. So as long as I'm still here, I could still be saving people. And as long as the people are here, I could feel yeah, survivor's I mean, guilt if somebody dies and they weren't saved. But yeah, well, I, I'm. It, it, it was just a thought. I'm not yeah. I'm saying yeah, yeah, I wasn't yeah. breaking it down super technically, but I'm just mm -hmm. thinking like we do know that there are many who have died and supposedly yeah. gone to hell if you're a believer. Mm -hmm. So there's still like it's an inescapable reality, yeah. you know, that that a believer assumes that they are going to heaven and that many scores of people mm -hmm. have gone to hell. Mm -hmm. And that that should Rather than most people are just so oh, lucky, I'm lucky to be me. That's their attitude. Mm -hmm. I, I rarely have seen people, I've never seen a believer who felt, wow, you know, they're, I don't know. I guess the, whatever. Yeah. Let's let, rather, rather, you know, rather than go down that rabbit hole, it was just a thought that mm -hmm. came to mind. Yeah, no, it's not a rabbit hole because I, I think what we're describing is that, you know, there, there are these structures in place that cannot help but produce. Mm -hmm. emotion you know if, if anybody has feeling emotions right that that things like survivor's guilt would yeah. be, be an inevitability like it's yeah. just you mm -hmm. can't you can't avoid that so is is that a sign of a certain kind of make-believeness and falsehood of it yeah. you know yeah but because, no, 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 yeah go ahead. It, it, did, it didn't hit me until i deconverted how callous i had been towards people of other faiths people who hadn't heard the gospel or people who heard the gospel in other regions or whatever, but never heard it the amount of times with the kind of mm -hmm. convincingness that I had heard it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So it's like people always say, oh, well, God will send missionaries, da, 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 da. And if, and if God doesn't, then, you know, maybe he'll be merciful, but we don't take into account how much, like 
how many times we hear the gospel before we actually respond to it in our culture? Is it mm -hmm. is it mm -hmm. really just of a, a just and loving God to have the gospel glance off a culture that's not as familiar with it as ours and say, oh, well, they heard it. Yeah, yeah. You know? mm -hmm. So, so, but I had no, so what you, your point about survivors is guilty with, I had no thought, no, no, no afterthought for those kinds of people because I was saved and I just chalked it up to, you know, hey, God's, God's mercy, yeah. God's mercy, God's whatever mercy, it is. Right. But when I deconverted, I, I said, oh my gosh, look at how, how much I was really ready to write off the majority mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, you know, I like how we're talking about this because, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about these other effects that aren't talked about as much, I feel. Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously we all know what the Christian one-liners would be and how they would try to maybe skirt the issue or talk about, you know, fall back on God's mercy, like we just talked about. But I think what happens is that because people don't really address it convincingly, mm -hmm. <laughs> that we, no one, no one learns how to develop tools, mm -hmm. no one facilities, right, right. internally to manage it deal with it um how to self-soothe even mm -hmm. right is, is it really enough to self-soothe to say that well god so loved the world right in, in those instances right mm -hmm. it's like i don't i don't even think as a believer in, in some sense there was real soothing when i heard mm -hmm. those words it's, um, it's like the gulf war right when they right it, when it was televised it looked like a video game on the news and mm -hmm. the bombs were being dropped from the sky you know, it's a different story when you're on the yeah. ground and you can see, but you yeah. know, uh, without going too far into the analogy. I mean, yeah, yeah, without, yeah, no, it's a perfect analogy. If you keep so, it superficial enough, you can build, you can handle certain things. Right. Hmm. And even extending to my own faith, my own personal struggles or, you know, whatever sins that I was struggling with or whatnot from a daily basis. You know, we, we would read in, in the New Testament, right, that all scripture is inspired and sufficient for our own, you know, sanctification. And I'm totally butchering it, but I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the verse exactly. These things were written for you and so forth. For you, right. Um, and that self-sufficiency of Christ and scripture and all that stuff, like I held to it, you know, as a Reformed Christian. But was it really working right hmm. i you know the the thing is i at some point you know i struggled with that but then at some point you know i even saw a christian therapy counselor you know and trying to kind of talk to them and deal with you know my problems with them it helped right it helped but i i also wonder if maybe part of what helped it was that he was more of a liberal kind of christian um, didn't really have the fundamentalist views that, you know, I was exposed to, uh, coming mm -hmm. out of MacArthur's church and being even in reform in the reform camp. But I, um, because there was a lack of facility or a lack of tools to actually mm -hmm. address these things, the moment I did leave the faith and then before I started to do a whole lot of other kind of deconstruction you know, before I even embarked on that, it was really scary. It was very challenging. It was, it was almost like, you know, it, it's almost like when a kid has to step out into the real world mm -hmm. without having had guidance from, you know, a mentor or, or a parent. And then now you have to navigate this world and now you have to figure this out yourself. <laughs> it's a mm -hmm. lot scarier, but, um, but it, you know, I, I like to use this analogy because now, now that, we're moving on from here that as a secular person that you have to learn how to put off the old and put on the new right and and that newness doesn't come by any kind of you know miracle any kind of faith story uh it's actually hard work you have to actually put in the work hmm. um which is you know, it's not to say, like, I know Brady and I know Jay Witt, like, when we were believers, like, it's not that we weren't working in that sense, right? We we were doing our best to be 
living our life based on grace and according to the counsel of God, you learn, I think, as, you know, we process these things and deconvert that um, what tends to, we, what we tend to notice is that we more or less moved away from a world where we are looking at these extreme beliefs and structures and how they become normalized. And then now we're kind of brought back down to earth. And then we have to more or less start to figure this out for ourselves. So it's that paradigm shift that I'm, I think I'm more or less trying to describe. Can, um, I, can I try to yeah. try to uh, restate what you were saying? Because I want to make sure, sure I understand of course. you. <laughs> yeah, you can help me. <laughs> are, you, are you saying that even as a Christian, you were dealing with mental health issues and you found help when you saw a Christian therapist but there was it, there was something about the Christian therapist that was unlike the rest of your Christian experience that helped. And you said it was he was maybe a little more liberal. Right. Like what like what was it about the Christian therapist that helped, unlike your Christianity previously helped? Was it Christian tools he was giving you that you weren't exposed to before, or was it just psychology tools that he was? It was giving you? it was psychology. So it be. I'm trying to be careful about how to talk about this because I don't want to open another can of worms about, you know, the whole areas of Christian psychology or biblical counseling or mm -hmm. whatnot. Like I don't want to get into that. But okay. but I, I think I think the I don't know if I'm gonna like I wouldn't necessarily say that he was part of that deconversion process, mm -hmm. but I am gonna say that in terms of how I've been able to develop tools over time, mm -hmm. right? Not not resorting to old myths or stories. We're talking about mm -hmm. real clinical research. We're talking about uh, mental health categories that are evolving, but help to understand, you know, ourselves better, and you know how to develop and become as a, a better as a person. Christian. As you're as you're right. hearing those things from your Christian therapist, did any part of you say? Hey, wait, this isn't in the Bible. <laughs> so what one of the things that he uh was kind of weird to me was he didn't actually believe in sex being permissible only in marriage. Hmm. You know, how was that? He's like, how was that? I didn't I never asked him because mm -hmm. I think I was scared to ask him. Hmm. But you know, he had a different moral ethic that mm -hmm. than, than what I was used to. But he also didn't use the bible to solve mm. you know what not solve but just even to address to address to, yeah 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 you, and you, you found you never that helpful that. i found that way more helpful than right yeah. than than what i got on sunday mornings or with the pastor yeah so i i have a, so. a very, really quick story that corresponds to that i remember it was 2008 i was in bible college in lancaster lancaster bible college and I had an intro to psychology course. I'll never forget uh, Dr. Chikara. He was the only African-American professor at the Bible college. And he was a psychologist. He was a psychologist. He did um, psychoanalysis. He taught a class on psychoanalysis. And i never forget because, you know, 2008, I had come through my experience as a urban missionary traveling the world with cross movement and all that. And some people don't know the reason, one of the reasons why, if not the main reason, cross movement disbanded was because we had interpersonal relational issues that we just were clueless as to how to address them. We didn't understand some things about ourselves. We didn't understand things about conflict resolution. We didn't understand a lot of things. Um, and I remember going through that class with Dr. Chikara and learning things about myself that I'd never realized before. And learning things about just conflict resolution and just group dynamics and all that. Yeah. But there was nothing in the course that really had anything to do with the Bible. It was all psychology. Right. And I remember sitting and saying, man, I wish I had had this. Now, we thought we had the spirit of God. We thought we had, you know, right. we had the Bible. <laughs> None of that helped us to maintain relationships that would have made us much more effective. I remember going through that psychology course and feeling like, man, I wish I had had this then. And I don't know if this contributed to my deconversion at all, but 
but I do know that it made me say, ah, so there, like, you know, we say as Christians, we say all truth is God's truth. And so I just tried to find out how is what these psychologists talking about? How is this God's truth too? (laughs) Because it's working, it's working in ways that this Bible stuff didn't for whatever reason. At least it was working for me in terms of helping me understand myself. So, so you might, they might say, well, it's obviously common grace. Yeah. Right. But how, but why, why, why do you, why is that not satisfactory to us? (laughs) I mean, yeah. Right. It's common grace that didn't end up in the scriptures is all I know. Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, I find that a pretty good analogy to this, I feel is when you're weightlifting and someone is spotting you, how often just believing that the person is there and they got your back helps Mm -hmm. you to lift the weight on your own. Right. But, but so you might be able to do more than you would do otherwise, because you have a person with their hand, the physical representation of a person's hand there to catch it. If you can't make it happen, gives you the extra strength, but you're actually lifting the weight by yourself. Right. Sometimes when a person that, yeah, you're tapping into that extra motivation or whatever, Mm -hmm. because you know, someone has your back and the person, sometimes you will see a person spotting a person and they're barely tapping Mm -hmm. the bar while the person's, but the person's lifting it. Yeah. And so there's a sense in which when you leave the faith, we remove the invisible kind of person who's holding, who's there to spot you. Mm. And it feels like it's more work, but any of the gains you were making while you were a believer were yeah. also being wrought by you too. You yeah. see what I'm saying? So yeah, there's a sense in which yeah. because it's false that there's a supernatural agent working in you to mm. help you gain sanctification or just basically become a better human being. Right. But you're looking to that supernatural agent, this make-believe person for the as the spotter while you're lifting the weights. Yeah. Then when you deconvert, you realize there's no one spotting you. So it feels like it's more difficult, but it's actually the same thing. It's just a matter mm-hmm. of changing your yeah. your psyche, your psyche. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And so I in think... a sense the go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. No, finish that. I was, I was just saying, in a sense, what we're talking about is essentially a, a placebo effect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. But, uh, that's a whole mm-hmm. other thing. Yeah. Right. So I, I think this kind of is a really good segue to the next point. And I, I think I think I want to do this. I was actually really excited about this because I know all of us, we've been exposed to John Owen at some point. Um, and then, you know, how certain people love to talk about mortification of sin, you know, uh, putting to death the deeds of the body, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I thought it would be really interesting to actually look at how John Piper talks about it, Mm. and then how we can look at it now. Um, Mm -hmm. And this kind of falls under what I would call, you know, the the normalizing of extreme beliefs. Now that that can fall under a lot of things. But I think for just to keep it focused for our purposes, let's We can do this uh, real quick. Fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Why fear and trembling? Why should I attack selfishness and attack anger and attack blaming and sullenness and self-pity? Why should I attack those with, with fear and trembling? And if you just let your mind spin off without any context, you'd say, because your life is at stake. You might go to hell if you don't, which is true. It's just not what he says. <laughs> the ground for my trembling here is not threat, but gift. Tremble, God Almighty, the creator of the universe, your father, your redeemer, your sustainer is in you. Amen. Willing and working, <laughs> tremble. Your acting is his acting. Amen. Amen, brother. If that hits you, that's what I meant by I don't wait for a miracle, I act the miracle. My attack on my sin in reliance upon the Holy Spirit rooted in the gospel is God's act, not mine. I worked harder than any of them. Nevertheless, it was not I, but the grace of God that was in me. When that lands on you, I mean, if you could feel that, you would tremble. My willing 
is the willing of the omnipotent God. My acting, my opposition is the acting and the opposition of the infinite, omnipotent, sovereign creator of the universe. He's that close to me. He's that involved with me. He's that much on my side. He's that much indwelling and shaping and forming my whole attack. Just a quick uh, popcorn comment. Sure. Great. Preachers or speakers are always really good at understanding how to communicate on a psychological level. That's all I was right. saying. Yeah, no, that's what something do you, what that do you they think? don't. Yeah, one hundred percent. And he, he he's going to get into the most psychological thing that he does here. You, you'll see in a moment is when he gets into his own personal anecdote or story. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I also felt like it was good to interrupt it just so that we don't become the purveyors of this. St- being uninterrupted <laughs> right of course yeah. there's, there's this there's a sense of which it's just it feels like a crime to let people listen to this without at least a chuckle it's, or, you know it's it it is a little painful to see this i yeah. absolutely agree but um there's a reason for it and i think i think it, it'll hopefully come up as we reflect on it so mm-hmm. illustration last sunday night so this is the warfare goes on last sunday night you remember, remember it? It was snowy, right? And, and I love it. I just love to get locked in. Can't go anywhere, so you're feeling okay. You're there, the family's home, and I'm sitting on the couch. Supper was over. Noel was working in her study. Talitha was cleaning up in the kitchen a little bit, and I was looking forward to doing something with Noel and Talitha. Watch something, do something, whatever, you know. And Talitha comes in, and she says, Mommy and I are going to watch Super Nanny on the computer. War. This is not the plan. She comes in. They go over. They set up the computer on the stool. Sit on the love seat. I'm on the couch. And turn it on and start watching. Now, praise God that some of you would have no problem with that at all. Everything in me said, this is so wrong. I am the dad here. I should be consulted at least. I mean, I want to watch two something, not that. So now, in the past, before I got serious about this, I think I would have simply sunk. I would have become angry. I would have uh, felt sorry for myself. They left me out. I would have blamed, and I would have gone upstairs sulking, thinking of something to say that would hurt them and make them feel sorry for me. Well, I did not do that. I saw it rising. I hated it. I'm going to kill this. So without any kind of cold shoulder, I said something simple and non-offensive and went up to my study and warred for about half an hour. Killing, bringing to mind every kind of promise, every kind of blood-bought precious inheritance, every good thing in my life. Set your mind on things that are above and Think on things that are pure and holy and just and commendable and good. And I was making war for 30 minutes until I killed it. And, oh. and here's, here's what I, 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 the test. I'm too, not a parent. I'm not a parent. So okay. I can't, none of us will, can't, probably can't say what I'm going to say. I'm not a parent. So I don't know what that's like to have people that you feel like owe you attention and owe you, you know, time and all that. But the way he's talking about his emotions and the kind of work it took to get over that and what he would have done had he not done that, (laughs) it sounds so childish and almost like I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> it's all right. Well, I probably won't let this part play, but maybe well, I don't know. You know, his 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 yeah. son is an atheist. An outspoken atheist. Right. And I just I, I can't help but wonder, like, what kinds of people are these that like 
I feel like having deconverted, I've I've matured emotionally, like a thousand times over, just in being mm. able to accept it is what it is. I can't control people. People don't owe me anything. You know, I don't. It, it is what it is. You live and you let live. You can't. But the way he's talking about how much work it took for him to kill, responding the way he wanted to respond to being hurt by his daughter's, yeah. you know, un unbeknownst to them, rejection of him. Right. It just sounds sick. Right. Sorry. Any, any any thoughts on that, Jay Wood, before we finish it off? I, I know this is, it's a little tough to go through, slog through, but. No, it's not. It's not tough. Yeah. I, I'm okay. glad you guys are breaking it up again. I just don't. Yeah, I don't yeah. want us to be the distributors of his <laughs> music. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's, we have to break it up with some sanity. We can't just sure. like play him yeah. in a seven fair. minute block on on Ichabod. We got to break yeah, it fair. up with some commentary. Fair. And I agree with Brady. I, I agree. I think. Yeah. I, although I wouldn't want to attribute this to Christianity. I, as, as as much as he looks like the mad scientist off of Back to the Future or whatever, and, and he's like this prof professorial kind of dignity that he has by his hoary head, I'm afraid that underneath of that facade is this huge child. That's what I. That's I mean, his commentary <laughs> strikes me as extraordinary, and I don't think Christianity is to blame uh, for that. You know, I think of course I think he was basically. Yeah. What he described was himself ego tripping because he wasn't consulted right. on the choice of a movie while they were snowed in. It's just nuts, you know. So is it surprising that a guy with a mega church and a huge microphone like he has is it has an ego trip? No, I don't think it's surprising at all. It's mm -hmm. more surprising that he's willing to admit to this in the middle of a sermon. Right. Like because if I so, heard that, I would immediately lose so much. Like if I were a parishioner there, I would be like, "What? <laughs> you got mad over that?" <laughs> Bro, I think about, should I, think I be about, following this guy? Yeah, I think about my nephew, right? So I've helped raise uh, three kids. My my sister had three boys, and I helped raise all three of them. The youngest one is now fourteen, and you know I spend all kind of time with him. I do things with him. I do things for him. But he's to the point now where he lives his life in his phone. He's in his phone constantly. Mm -hmm. And so when he comes down now, I go over, I spend time with him. He's typically in his room the entire time. Um, his, you know, my sister always wants him to come out and watch movies with us. But I'm like, we grew up on movies. That was our thing. This generation, they're not watching movies. They're watching YouTube and TikTok and they're playing video games. And there's a part of me that's like, you know, I started taking them to play pool. He's pretty good at pool. He seemed to like it. I bought him a pool stick. But sometimes when he's when he's when he's down here, I'm like, hey, you want to go shoot some pool? And I can see in his face, he just wants to spend time on his phone. There's a part of me that's like, oh, but I'm your uncle. Don't you want to da, 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 da? But I'm like, if that's what you want to do, then do that. If you ever want to do something different, hey, hit me up. I'll I'll come pick right. you up. We'll go shoot pool. But right. do I remember being a kid? I remember one, remember wanting to do certain things and just and just being in my joy when I could do those things. I'm like, yo, I'm not going to get bent out of shape at the fact that you don't want to go shoot pool with me. We'll we'll get it in at some point, but do you? Like, right. it's no big deal. So yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I don't know. So, so you, I, I'm you, glad. You, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Jabo. I I just again popcorn. You can see. I thought the thing that was that was going to stand out, which I'm sure you guys noticed, is a lot of his objection to what was happening was based on this idea of headship in his house, that he's the guy who's the executive and that yeah. the decision. So that's something I've never had in general. Mm. Uh, <laughs> right. Just this feeling of entitlement where in any relationship that I have, that mm. I'm whether I am the father or whether I am the it's, you know, I always look at it as a team whenever we're doing anything. And I've never had this. It shows you that there is, it's not only subordination, there's definitely ego with it. Because mm -hmm. you know how he talks about, they talk about, was it complementarianism? With mm -hmm. He's a complementarian. Yeah. Where he doesn't believe it's not totally egalitarian in, to, in the sense where the woman, he I feels that subordination according, I think is Philippians 2. Um, it, that subordination where they took a, talk about Christ's humiliation and that he was equal, being equal with God, he didn't consider 
um, quality was that something to be, to be, to be, to be when he made himself lower. Right. Yeah. So the idea is that subordination does not imply unequal. Mm -hmm. That, in other words, you can be separate but equal, so to speak. You know, <laughs> um, and but this shows to you that in his mind. I don't know. Hopefully the audience can understand where I'm getting mm -hmm. with this. This shows that subordination in his mind, there is a certain kind of inequality. At least it's enough to have thrown him into an ego trip mm -hmm. when he thought he was being usurped. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 So I, I really love what you guys have said. Um, I think Jay Witt talking about how the cultural, uh, I guess, background that he has you know, could, you know, affect his judgment and how he has, hasn't taken into account, you know, other things in, in the Bible that could be, you know, of, of that show more of an egalitarian uh, position. And then I think Brady, some of the things you said is already leagues more mature mm -hmm. than, uh, you know, I think how Piper's trying to, um, exculpate or not not exculpate but just just dig you know doing that mort mortification work that you know mm. is self-flagellating almost right mm. or it is actually so i i love those comments i think um i'm, I'm gonna play this out i'm gonna finish this out okay and obviously brady cut this however you want to do it mm. but i want to do what um i want to pretend that either being a counselor to him and maybe even a family member, how I would talk to him if he were to express this. Okay. Um, I want to kind of take what, what you guys think on that. So right. uh, I'm going to play this out. I know it's tough, but bear, yeah. bear with us audience. Of whether I could kill it. This may not be the way you prove it, but the test of whether I could kill it is whether I could not forget it that morning, but actually mention something to Noel in a totally non-condemning way. That's the huge challenge for me. Could I deal with that moment in a way that didn't indirectly and subtly blame, condemn? And I, I think the words I used later, and, 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 and she felt the, the freedom, I think. After a half later, hour of work. I said, you know, I was right. kind of surprised <laughs> that that happened. And, and she brought out what she had said to Talitha and what they'd done. It was a lot of miscommunication. Talitha was supposed to say this, blah, blah, blah. And, and it was over. And in the past, it wouldn't have been over for a week. <laughs> Two weeks. Yikes. Conclusion. That, that wasn't even a real, yes. that's not a real thing. <laughs> right. A thousand wow. times better if on that couch, that sin never arose in my heart. It would be a thousand times better if this 65-year-old preacher never had those feelings. That's the way it'll be in heaven. I want that. I would like that. That day will come. It may come in this life. It may not. And my point here is, until that day comes, part of God's will for your and my strategy in sanctification is a empowered, Holy Spirit-shaped and driven, blood-bought, willing against a particular sin until we kill it in that moment. It may come again tomorrow. But in that moment, we're going to kill it. And we will stay on it until it's dead. We All right. I think that's enough. Thank you. Some, uh, some observations I want to make about Piper in that talk. So hmm. when we talk about normalizing extreme beliefs, um, <laughs> I don't know how healthy it is, right? to consider every step we make every feeling we have mm. every thought every desire that we might have and you tie that to some kind of cosmic significance right mm. who else does that right like you know if, if you if, if anybody the audience out there all you have to do you know if you're still a believer you're thinking about this is like mm. do you honestly believe that that's something not only like more than just healthy or unhealthy is it, it does it even make sense does mm -hmm. it even you know in 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 the cosmic scheme of things that 
you think that it's helpful or even real or, or just convincing in any way that every thought or desire or thing, you know, is tied to every single minutia. Um, now, I know what the Christians will say, but this is where I think we have to, you have to really think for a minute and think that how is, does it seem right at all? Does it seem proportional that those kinds of minutias or details in your own life correspond to the cosmic significance like that? That's, that's point number one. I think that's where, that's where the, the pathology starts, but Hold number real quick. two, real, real quick, yeah, go ahead. just to be clear. Yeah. Um, you said normalizing extreme beliefs. Right. What could you identify what the extreme belief is that's being normalized the, there? The extreme, the the normalization of when I say normalization, I think more about yeah. You, you critique this if you want, but um, it's the daily trivial mundane things. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to call the normalization of things. Mm -hmm. But when you inject extreme beliefs about it, thinking that an all omniscient God is watching you, mm. your every single move in this, and how you respond to it is, as Piper says, God willing, right? Mm. Are you acting accordance to that? Uh, that is what I call a normalization of an extreme belief. Um, does that does that make sense? Does that seem like it checks out? I don't know. I, I think the audience can also kind of chime into that as well um because it, it, it i in, in in other words you you can talk about normalization in the sense of yes there's a believing in that people will go to hell if you don't believe in making that yeah i guess it, it would still fit right it, it's normative in terms of you're walking along as if that you know is a reality but are you really thinking about that reality Mm. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and i think that's where the pathology starts um yeah um and i think maybe you you did clarify the normalizing part i guess i want to make sure that people don't miss when you use the term extreme belief are you saying an extreme belief because as a christian what's the what is the extreme belief in the eyes of the christian would they would they be able to identify or at least um concur that there's something extreme about this belief? Like, how are you defining what's an extreme belief? Well, no, well, I, I, won't, I won't expect a lot of Christians to mm -hmm. agree to that, right? Yeah. Or agree to what I, we may point out because um, it's been normalized for you. It's right. been, uh, it's been, it, 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 you could talk, you talk about it in terms of doctr indoctrination, mm -hmm. you talk about it in terms of, uh, how people in the church talk about it with each other uh, from a cultural standpoint. Um, I guess what yeah, I'm getting I, at is what, yeah. what makes a belief extreme then? So if this is from the outside looking sure. back in, what makes it extreme? Is it just the fact that it's supernatural? Is it the fact that it can't be um, verified? Uh, what may, may I inter may I interject? Yeah. Uh, I believe what he's saying is that because of the mundanity of the situation, that is, mm -hmm. he was approached about watching a movie, a simple kind of non-controversial movie. He gets really upset, but then he invests this conflict that I'm sure his relatives did not know was even happening mm -hmm. with this cosmic purpose. Okay. I think that I think it's the investing something that's so mundane with this this meta kind of purpose that he feels is an extreme thing. Now he's not, of course, you know, trying to express obviously the Christian, I shouldn't even say the Christian, because I don't know that every mm -hmm. Christian would agree with this, that this is correct. But at least but from Piper's standpoint, this is a normal thing. And that's why he's saying that he's normalized. Yeah, there's a there's an extreme amount of ego that has to be present for a person to even think that this takes on these sorts of proportions, you know. So, uh, so let me if I if I could be stated, tell me if what, you, what I'm saying is, is what you mean by this, Al. So even the concept of sin, 
is an extreme belief because I think the word that helped me was what Jay Witt just said. You're making it a cosmic issue as opposed to you had a self-interest that turned into selfishness and you turned it into a cosmic deal. That's extreme. Correct. Okay. I get it now. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Um, because oftentimes what Christians will call sin, like we could look at it and say, no, that's, that's, it's not, it's not that big of a deal. It's, it's a, it's a natural desire. Um, I, I use Piper's example, I think, because I think it also highlights he's, he's choosing something so seemingly trivial, mm -hmm. but it can apply to, you know, it, it's kind of like a lesser to the greater argument in a sense, yeah, 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 for because sure. you, you can, you can ratchet that up. Yeah. Um, and preachers do that all the time as a, as a preacher, right. you're not going to talk about the worst example you can give. You're not going to mention exactly. your, your porn addiction or whatever. Right. You find something that's kind of, you know. Kind of fuzzy and kind of know, fuzzy. Almost, yeah, just <laughs> it's it's almost a cute example, but like you said, you right. could ratchet it up and apply it to more dark things. But yeah. you know, from from our vantage point, even that the way he presented that was it was very dark. Right. Yeah, I think he I, I think he thought he was being application oriented by giving you something that's very mundane. But mm -hmm. what I was saying is that this is an extreme thing to to cross examine. Even the most simple thing, like I don't want to watch a movie, and to, to it for it to turn into a soliloquy where a person is, I don't know, in a sense, very vivifically illustrating it, like you know, with all the sword, hand, very uh, histrionic. Mm -hmm. it, it, this is it's just it's pretty over the top. It's kind of extreme. Yeah. I think, yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry, not to. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. That that's all part of the presentation and. Uh it's all tied in with the message. Um, so, um, the, it, it's funny. I, I, I'd be curious to see how the audience kind of responds to this or how, how you might respond to Piper. I know that for, you know, you're totally right, Brady, that not all Christians would necessarily agree with this approach to your personal, you know, sanct sanctification, but I, you know, I, I would argue back, you know, it's like how, how, why, why would it be, I mean, why not? <laughs> <laughs> right um you know if you think about the doctrine of hell the doctrine of sin how how much god hates sin right uh that christ had to come and die for it uh, but that you know there is aspects of dying to the sin right that the christian has to live in order to you know at, at one day see you know christ in glory um those are you know, all, you know, it's all yeah oh, i'm so sorry i, I no no worries good i i think that's also a way that you can keep christians constantly under on their knees is if they can right. constantly find examples of ways that they're sinful even in the most innocuous oh i didn't want to watch a movie oh i'm being sinful i got to go up and spend an hour in the the prayer closet to do it. it's like <laughs> you'll ne like you will never feel like you're meritorious of anything if if you can right cross-examine even i don't want to watch a movie <laughs> this way you know <laughs> like of course you'll you'll have a an abundance of things to be asking god for forgiveness for mm -hmm. if this is the way you look at life you know so i think there's a there's a utility to him using it. it's you know he's not talking about a guy who had a sudden urge to kill someone or something he's talking about something that's totally innocuous You're right um and and it becomes this thing of oh i'm a great sinner because i didn't want to watch well of course you're going to need to cross if the of course everybody's unworthy if that makes renders you unworthy you get what i mean yeah, yeah. right so let, let, let let's go back a bit cuz let, let's let's think about what piper said how he expressed himself and how it kind of relates to the mental health aspect right because we talked about how extreme beliefs are normalized we talked about how you know um how just this entire kind of system the way it's set up right can uh you know i mean lack of a better word i mean how it just bogs you down um but from my kind of experience from my therapist with therapy you know since i've been uh since i left the faith um 
I think I would approach it differently, right? I think I would, you know, if I, I'm not Piper, I don't have the struggles that he has. Mm -hmm. And I think the three of us can so easily judge him, uh, you know, even the way he was so honest about his struggles. It's like, oh my God, like you're, 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 str you're struggling with that. That's, that's your problem, right? <clears throat> but one of the things that I've learned over the years is that no matter who you are, right? No matter if you're a Christian or not, if you've been raised in a fundamentalist or church or not, even just who you are as a person, right? Maybe you're more of a selfish person. Maybe you're more of a, maybe you're a bit of a narcissist. Maybe you have struggled with drug addiction. Um, think about all of the cultural, even like from a secular perspective, how we judge people right from, from as a culture um let alone you know within the church you know, which is even worse i would I, I would i would argue but um any approach to good therapy right is you don't you you don't elicit structures that induce more guilt more shame mm -hmm. more ways to beat yourself down mm -hmm. right and you look at Piper, his his instinct, right? His instinct was, now, now, granted, I'll, I'll give him a little credit, right? He has grown up a little bit, right? Because it, it's it's horrible. It, it sounds like you know, the kind of guy I used to be, I guess, right? He would make his you know family feel awful for him, like, oh my god, like, mm. are you kidding me? But let's 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 take a time machine and go back to that Piper, right? What what would I say to that Piper, you know? Maybe we need to talk about why are you feeling this way, <laughs> number mm -hmm. one, right? There's, there's, there's a reason why people have some, you know, I almost feel like that's a bit of a traumatic response to, to what he's dealing with. Like maybe there's some insecurity going on there. Mm -hmm. Who knows, right? Now, granted, he grew up in a culture that was patriarchal, you know, it was more, but any good patriarch wouldn't respond that way, right? I, I would assume, but I, I would want to know, okay, why do you feel this way? Um, maybe we need to talk, you know, maybe this goes back to your childhood. Maybe this goes back to a traumatic experience you've had. Maybe we can talk about, you know, when that feeling arises up again in the future, instead of saying you need to kill this, right? You need to take a gun and shoot that. Maybe you just need to take a time out, just step out of the room. You don't even need to talk, you know, even, you know, he, he talked about, oh, I used to, you know, say something to make them feel bad. So I tried to not, I said something to not give them a cold shoulder. You don't even have to say that. Maybe you just need to leave. Maybe, maybe you just need to get out of that situation for a minute. And maybe you just need to decompress. And then when, what was that? No, I was going to add something to that, yeah. but no, go no, 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 no. I, so well, decompress, not feel bad that those feelings came up for mm -hmm. yourself, right? But you acknowledge that those exist. And therefore, once you decompress, then you can reflect on it. And then you can think about other ways that, you know, you can act differently in the future. And maybe you need to share that with your family, just like, you know, when you're not triggered, mm -hmm. you know, at a time when you, you're more relaxed and calm, then you can have a good heart to heart conversation with your wife and your kids about well, it. Well, he, he almost you know. did kind of do what you said. He did step out. He went upstairs. He took 30 minutes. 30 minutes. To, yeah. to, to kill well, it. He, but, but he killed it, right? He, mm. he went up, he went upstairs to basically mm. go to war with it. He's right. going to war with himself. Yeah. Right. But maybe instead of going to war with it, maybe all you have to do is just take a breather, <laughs> take a breather and just say, Hey, this is not, I, I think, I think what Brady is saying is, in, in effect, that's what he did. Yeah, I agree with you too. I agree no, with no. you, but, but so, I think I think what he's saying is that by virtue of yeah, what he did when he went upstairs was is the thing that you say he shouldn't do. But by virtue of just getting away from the situation that was getting tense for him, he gave himself space to go to war with it, which is. Right, but that's. A I know, I know, I, I know. I lost a connection, so I know I cut out. But okay, yeah, I don't, I don't want to prolong it. But basically, yeah, 
I, I, I know what you're saying. He probably handled it unhealthily. Right. But. Well, he, he handled it with theology. Right. I'm mm -hmm. not talking about that. You're talking right. psychology. I'm, I'm talking about psychology, but I'm talking about practical methods where you don't have to tear yourself down, mm. right? You don't have to kill, gotcha. put to death the deeds of the body. Right. Mm -hmm. There there are biological and psychological reasons why someone would have such a thing, have such a mm -hmm. feeling or have such a... And that requires work. That requires... And I'm not talking about the kind of work we're talking about in sanctification. I'm talking about not having that kind of baggage and yeah. feeling like you have to essentially. You're saying addressing your... the real problem. This is like what you're saying. Is... No, I think it's it's deeper than that. It's not just addressing. It's, it's identifying right. the real problem. Right. Well, yeah. But I'm just he's saying, identifying like, it as he... his flesh as opposed to right. like I was saying, saying psychological like... issues that might be going on. When I'm saying addressing, I don't mean, I mean, he under he, Albert has identified this is a real thing and this is where it's right. coming from. Mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and there's a sense in which he's addressing the problem now, but he's using make-believe categories to address it. Mm -hmm. He's not, he's not, he, so Albert's saying it's, it's a, it's a psychological issue. It's not a right. theological issue. And then what, one point that I want, wanted to get to was this act of, you know, how we self-soothe. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, that's, that's a skill that you learn to do as you mature. Not everyone, you know, everyone's kind of, not everyone can do that. Um, but there is something to say, of course, that the Christian self soothes a certain way, but the type of self soothing that they get into is, has, you know, it, it carries with it all of the guilt, all of the the, the other ways in which you can to just completely self-deprecate yourself, you know, to yourself in front of others, you know, it, so it, inherently, I think the, the, the way that I've learned to self-soothe as a secular person, it, it doesn't come with all that, right? It, I, I've learned, you know, you know, let's say that I've been in a situation where, um, you know, let, let's say my partner triggered the hell out of me. Right. She she said something that was offensive to me or um, that I didn't like very well. What how are the self-soothing thing? You know, what are the self-soothing mechanisms that I had to do was, OK, number one, you walk away from it. Hopefully it doesn't always work, but I walk away from it. I try to calm down. But then what do I tell myself? I tell myself, OK, well, she's having a bad day. Right. She's. Um, dealing with certain things from her work. She has, you know, uh, she has some physical pain going on right now. I'll just give her a break, right? It's not, it's not something to be, you know, it could be that, but maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's me, mm. right? I have to ask myself, maybe, okay, maybe it's me. Then maybe I have to think about what, what, what are ways to be compassionate to yourself, right? Well, okay, maybe I'm having a bad day. Maybe uh, it's cancer. Maybe it's dealing with all the, the shit that I had to deal with, mm -hmm. you know, from a cancer treatment perspective. Uh, there are some, you know, uh, physiological things that happened to me that had some distressing emotional uh, symptoms, right? And once again, you know, a, a lot of the self-soothing process, a lot of it is is you trying to not only figure this out, but Sometimes you don't even know. So what do you what do you do when you don't know? Well, okay. Well, you have to figure. You have to maybe guess. Maybe take a guess. Hmm. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's that. But you know what? Even doing that felt a lot better than anything that I've learned as a Christian to do. Hmm. You know, trying 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 to find ways to be not only more compassionate to yourself but understanding yourself even. Right. That that alone itself does way more. And I think uh, trying to somehow shovel this particular sin that I have or something into the gospel somehow and then hmm. think that, you know, oh, God is watching me. And therefore, you know, am I living the gospel <laughs> on a daily basis? I don't know. All that all that crap. Hmm. Um, but that's, you know, I I when I, when I was kind of watching Piper you know, 
do this, you know, and I've, and I've heard him talk about this a lot, you know, the sin of unbelief, right? Any, any time that we sin, it is a result of unbelief to some form, right? And that's once again, what's happening, right? You, you, you know, people, people can say, okay, well, it's not a meritorious thing that is being thrown at you, but at the same time, how could it not be? Right. We, we are failing at something or some standard. Sure. It's not works righteousness, but it's still some standard of faith mm. that we need to have. Otherwise, why are we still continuing to sin? Mm. Um, yeah. So any, any, any thoughts to that? <laughs> I know I went on a long spiel there. Um, um, yeah. I mean, I'll go back to, like I said, with my nephew, I think what made it so easy for me to not get offended or feel rejected or, you know, take it personal was I put myself in his shoes. And I think that's right. what, that's what empathy does. Like you, you, you stop worrying about your self-interest. You think about somebody else's self-interest. You put yourself in their shoes and say, man, why would I want to spend all day on that video game if I was that person? Oh, well, I get that. If I was my daughter, why would I want to go watch Super Nanny and not whatever? And why wouldn't I be thinking about what dad wants to do? Well, because I'm however old I am and my world is very limited. You know, my, my world, like you put yourself in somebody else's shoes and you have empathy. You can understand why they're doing what they're doing, even if you wouldn't do that, but you're not them. And what's wrong with you? Because he even said in there, you know, why wasn't I consulted? You know, Maybe I would want to watch something too. Not that. So you're already saying you have an agenda that you wouldn't want to watch what they're watching. You'd want to do something that you'd want to do. Why not put yourself in their shoes and say, well, dang, that's what y'all want to watch? Okay, I'll watch that with you all. Like there's something about, you know, you know, the, the Christian motto is, you know, dying to yourself. Um, but as an atheist, even as a humanist and as somebody with empathy, I can die to myself pretty quickly and just see how what makes somebody else feel alive and just be glad that they're feeling alive. That's what you want to do? That's what makes you feel alive right now? Cool. I'm going to celebrate you doing that. I had a different idea, but I'm not going to take it personal. So, so even the, to me, even the stepping away and self-soothing and all that, I think that's a method, but I think sometimes it's just as simple as recognizing that in the same way that you've got once and desires and needs so does somebody else and they may not meet them the way that you do okay like allow that um yeah i i think if i i think if he calmly came to me later and told me like it seems he implies he did that yeah, he, he got he, that upset mm -hmm. pardon what'd you say yeah we we kind of talked over what he what he really said but he said you know later he was able to say in a way that didn't sort of as he as much as he thinks let on what he said to her was i was surprised that that's what you guys wanted to do and that was his way of opening up the conversation but go ahead yeah if he, if he had have done that i would have been mortified and i would have been that would have actually triggered me much more than anything actually because then i would have in other words, if if I were in the shoes of his wife or the, the daughter, that would have been something I would have preferred him to keep to himself because mm -hmm. it was such an innocuous thing mm -hmm. right. that that, right. It, that it would cause such an extreme reaction. <laughs> I wouldn't want to know that it actually caused it because it's like, wow, I talk about walking on eggshells. Right. I mean, yes. you you wonder why yes. his why his son is like this outspoken atheist now. I mean, if if this is what this guy mm. was like to live with. I can only imagine, mm. you know, it just seems very petty or mm. whatever, you know? Yeah. So I, I, you know, I, I often wondered, you know, it, 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 I, I know that Piper is doing this, you know, as a way to, I think, relate to um, his audience, his, his, his congregation. Um, and, there, there, that's one of the things that I liked about Piper, at least back in the day. Mm -hmm. I, I, I liked the fact, I, I remember they were at a, he was at a conference with uh, MacArthur and he said on the, you know, they had the Q&A session 
And um, this was after I left MacArthur's church. So, you know, this, there's kind of highlights why I was glad leaving. But, you know, Piper was on stage being very candid about himself. And he talked about how he had suffered from depression for many years. Hmm. And to the point where he would just start crying and he wouldn't know why. He, he would just, you know, out of the blue, right? And, and he talked about how there was one occasion when he was at home and he just started crying for no reason. And then his, 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 his wife would ask him, you know, what's going on. And then he said, I have, don't have an, I you know, don't have a clue. I don't know why. And MacArthur's response to that was he, you know, he, he responded in humor, <laughs> but in, in a way where it was kind of like, he, it's like, I don't, I don't understand anyone yeah. why, how that can happen to anybody, you know, and the whole you know, the audience started laughing. Um, it's like, I, 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 I can't imagine just sitting there and crying and not mm. knowing why. Right. And I saw that I'm like, of course, MacArthur mm. would say that. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, that's one of the things that I appreciated about him. But think about all of the disservice that he is doing to not only his constituency, mm -hmm. but to even other Christians where they are not seeking the help that they need to get mm -hmm. because they, they're going to chalk it up to David Brainerd's depression right? The, you know, if anybody here knows about David Brainerd's life and the kind of debilitating depression he, and, and they look to David Brainerd as a model of Christian depression, if, if you can call it that, uh, someone who struggled with it, maybe that's not fair, but someone, a Christian who struggled with it, who wrote very explicitly about his struggles and, you know, probably attempted to, you know, commit suicide numerous times, but um, to me, the, the, this is where I think one of the real travesties about Christianity and how they talk about, you know, mental illness and all that stuff is that people, that they, they are not having their congregation get the help that they need. Um, and obviously it becomes much worse because then they will talk about how destructive, you know, man-centered thinking and psychology is and um and this is where you know i, I to, to be frank you know th this is part of why you know i am embarking on this pod is because i think we need to mm. really challenge you know those assumptions and that culture um you know uh my my partner you know without sharing too much has struggled deeply with mental health and being in the church you know made it worse for mm -hmm. her um and it's not until many years later that she started to get the help she needs and and you know she's all of a sudden feeling some hope mm -hmm. right but for many years she you know was despondent was mm -hmm. suicidal a couple of times um because she felt like she didn't live up to god's standards even though she tried to be gospel centered in her life. Mm. Um, but, you know, the, she's not the only story there. There are so yeah. many stories out there who reflect this uh, type of pathology, like living under a pathological environment mm. um, and suffering the consequences for many years because of it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I could see how that kind of preaching. Like you, now, now I get it. I think we just colored in the sketch of normalizing uh, extreme behavior, like under. And this this also brings out Jay Witt's point. Maybe I don't even need to say it again, but I just think it's worth saying that point about you know if you could put that kind of a micro microscope on your life and something that that small now stands out as a, you know, that molehill becomes a mountain and evidence of just how sinful you are, how corrupt you are. Um, the way that that causes you to look at yourself and now everything is, you know, you're going around trying to mortify the flesh and kill your sin and you're looking at every everything that your heart does. Your heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? I mean, you become a... 
I don't know, in, in one sense, it, it, it does it make you a better person for other people if you're always inspecting any self-interest you have and identifying it as the worst sin ever? I guess in one sense, it could make you feel like you'd become a better person if you're always killing anything that, that could ever come across as a me moment. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I feel like you have the Ten Commands, and then with this kind of analysis, you have just an mm -hmm. infinite amount of ways of commands, essentially. Like, yeah. you know, you can go well in the, well above, I guess this is that Matthew 5 type extrapolation that Christians do, whereas, like, they take Christ working through the law, and it's such a, an elastic kind of legal code that... <laughs> <laughs> pretty much anything could be a sin. Like anything's like I said, if, if if everything's a sin, you're always on your knees. If you're always on your knees, you never get the chance to 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 reflect on the whole scheme. You never yeah. get a chance to zoom out. Yeah. You know, they're yeah. like at the foot of we're all at the foot of the cross. Well, yeah, when you're at the foot of the cross, <laughs> you can't see it, it's all bullshit. <laughs> right. You know, if I can yeah, keep exactly. your perspective that close to the cross, yeah, you can't zoom out and realize it's an invisible cross. Like there's wow. nothing, there isn't shit there, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I think the reason why I wanted to bring Piper was because it was a way for us to, um, I think, kind of interact with something that we were, were kind of used to, mm. <laughs> or we've been exposed to in the past as, as Christians, uh, and then kind of offer something a little different than what kind of maybe what I've learned uh, as a secular person through uh, self-soothing and um you know what, what what was that word what was that phrase i called it it was uh it was like uh i forgot just <laughs> I forgot. that quick <laughs> yeah i forgot that quick too but um but yes just developmentally as well as how mm. we manage our own problems and challenges there's a way to do it without mm. uh literally self-flagellating and and mm. being so uh with a kind of self-hatred that you see mm. in in piper's uh um exhortation yeah <laughs> which is strange to say it that way mm -hmm. so um so anyway so i want to move on to kind of the next segment here and i want to talk about uh religious trauma yeah. um are you guys how familiar are you guys with this category from like the world of psychology or what you might know any any thoughts on that I'm slightly familiar with it in that I've I've seen um I've seen many deconverting deconverted uh, people talking about religious trauma. I actually just signed up for a course um in religious trauma. They offer a a certificate um to actually be oh, cool. trained in dealing with religious trauma. Oh, I'm wow. going I'm going through it for myself. But I'm also going through it so that I can help all these other people that I end up counseling. Okay, awesome. But, but what you're about to go through is going to sort of be like a precursor for right. that for me. So right. well, that's cool. Um Jay Witt, any any thoughts on Yeah, I'm just the resident uninformed individual here on this <laughs> this matter. So uh... <laughs> it's not oh, true. Come yeah. on. Well, <laughs> and, and let me, wait, wait. Let me say this too. I know that I have religious trauma. I know it. I can tell by the how active I am on social media dealing with things and calling things out a lot of it is to to sort of like point out to other people hey this is not true but a lot of it is me processing my own religious trauma so mm -hmm. yeah same, well, yeah, same they, goes for me yeah the, the, the old song says uh take your burdens to the lord and leave them there you know <laughs> so I mean yeah. that, that 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 shows that you guys were never true Christians. So if, you, okay. Okay. if you really let, let took your burdens to the Lord and left them there, you wouldn't have any burdens right now, right? Mm, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Blame the victim. Okay. Blame there the would be, victim. There wouldn't be any trauma. There's no yeah. trauma for the guy who There's left no his burdens. At all. Mm -hmm. yeah, leave them there. Leave them there. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Mm -hmm. For anybody in the audience who are curious about this, if uh, you're into kind of reading some studies, uh, this is a study that I uh, did some reading into. I, you know, I didn't do like a fully in-depth, but I, um, it's it's from the Global Center for Religious Research. 
yeah so, so it's from well this is from last year this is from the summer of of, of 2023 or is, are they citing a, a study this is a before? very recent yeah this is a pretty recent study and and you know i you know obviously you know I, it remains to be seen like how extensive the study is what you know what the parameters were in terms of like what you know they were looking for rts but, reform religious uh Reformed Theological Seminary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Religious thank, thank, uh, trauma syndromes. Th thankfully, it's not RT. Yeah, it's not uh, Reformed Theological Seminary. But yeah. um, but it, it, they give some statistics on this, and I, I think it's worth hearing. So mm. um, so the sociological study aimed to ascertain the percentage of, of adults living in the United States who have experienced religious trauma, RT. And what percentage presently suffer from RT symptoms now? Right. So I think the kind of this before and kind of after element to this study is is worth noting. Huh. Um, after compiling data from one uh, 1,581 adults living in the U.S., the study concludes it is likely that around one third, so 27 to 33 percent of U.S. adults conservatively have experienced religious trauma at some point in their life. That number increases to 37% if those suffering from any three of the six major RT symptoms are included. And it is also likely that around 10 to 15% of U.S. adults currently suffer from religious trauma if only the most conservative numbers are highlighted. So hmm. now, given there, there are limits to this study, right? You know, we're, we're talking about 1,581 adults, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's not necessarily the biggest pool, right? Mm -hmm. But it... It is a good indication, right? How many people have you heard of, or how many studies have you heard of? Like, you know, at least tries to be somewhat statistically significant, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I think generally speaking, this is a pretty good pull number to, to you know, get some insights on. Yeah. But this, you know, leads me to the point where, you know, like just imagine. I don't know. Just imagine like you're joining any kind of group right? Like maybe you have a shared interest in something or, um, you know, some sort of community, right? And given the conservative numbers of the study, just imagine that if you, you had a disclaimer going into this group, you'd say, hey, hold on, like, you know, we want people want you to be here. But just let you know, <laughs> there's going to be a, at least Mm. A thirty percent chance, if no more, mm. that you're going to experience some level of trauma as a result of being here. As a result of being here, mm -hmm. um, mm. that's crazy. <laughs> I mean, right? Mm. I, I, I don't know. It, it puts it in perspective in in that way, where I think you know, mm. obviously the, the 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 naysayers, right, might say, well, okay, well, that goes with any, you know any endeavor or any group you that's what i was join. just sitting here thinking yeah you're dealing with there's humans always, aren't you going to you can be talking about marriage with, raising yeah, yeah. kids there's there's a risk involved right. right there's risk involved anywhere but i think what's interesting about this study however mm -hmm. is that there are actual categories uh you know religious trauma is not like a new concept right it, it it's been around for some time it hasn't been codified yet in any uh, di diagnostic statistic statistical manual, right? Mm -hmm. It's not in the DSM-5. Uh, there is a lot of conversation in the clinical background about, you know, including that at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. But there is lots and lots of literature around this, and they've been able to categorize what constitutes religious trauma. Mm -hmm. So this isn't just some kind of like, well, you know, there's risk in anything. Well, no, there, there's actually some uh, clinical scientific basis for understanding this dynamic and, uh, you know, the kind, you know, it, in, 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 in detail and in vivid detail, uh, the kinds of experiences that people have associated with being in a religious institution. So mm. um, any, any thoughts on that, guys? I, I know we talking about some clinical data, but yeah, I wonder if you guys have any thoughts on that. No, just the the other side of what I was just saying, like anytime yeah. you're dealing with human beings, you're, you're running the risk of being traumatized by them. Yeah. But the reason why I think this study is interesting is because 
there's I think there's a specific type of trauma when you're dealing with a religion because it's not just that you're dealing with other people. You're dealing with other people in a very systematic, um, like you've introduced a third person into your other people uh, relationship. So it's you, the other people, and then there's this God that you're now, and this God is all power. He knows all your thoughts. It, like it's so much more invasive and so much more private than just even your marriage, even your, you know, you, you've got a third person, a third party yeah. who's who's always with you as far as you're concerned while you're believing this stuff. So I think it's a specific kind of trauma. And this third person speaks to every area of your life. Right. So it's 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 not the same as just saying, oh, well, anytime you're gonna go into a you know a room with other people, you'll you can be traumatized. No, this is this is unique. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing I would add to that is that any any to, to those who would doubt the, the severity of religious trauma, you needn't look very far to, to see its source. Uh, it's right there in the text for those who were the biblicist type. Mm -hmm. The scriptures are constantly, um, um, Romans 12 tells us to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, so Philippians 2, if I'm not mistaken, he, that's where he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. So there's a constant um, yeah. both deprogramming and programming of people. And it's a very psychological thing. I mean, they're constantly talking about the mind. Yeah. And, and May the, the words and, and, of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Think about the kind of pressure right. that puts mm -hmm. upon you to, to right. police, to micromanage <laughs> your your thoughts and your words all day long so that you're you're not displeasing to the Lord. Yeah, it was it 2 Corinthians, uh, was it like 10 or 11? It's 10, where he talks about taking thoughts every thought captive, captive to Christ. Every, every thought, thought captive. Yeah. Every yeah. thought, yeah. So, the obedience so, of Christ, yeah. Yeah, so, so no one should just dismiss what you're, the, I'm just saying that the grounding for the stuff that you're seeing, particularly for Christians, because I guess this is religious trauma that could be Muslim, mm -hmm. Muslim religious trauma, any other kind of religion. Mm -hmm. But for Christians, we know that the way it's practiced here yeah. in America by a lot of evangelicals is a very psychological religion. They're constantly telling you to to check your motives, to you know, to to mm -hmm. put on the mind of Christ. Here, so you end up having, I mean, if you take it very far, you end up having almost a certain kind of schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. um because you you're it's you who's actually doing all of this is having <laughs> yeah. this conversation <laughs> yeah but, yeah go ahead go ahead Brady. no 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 finish that go ahead mm -hmm. yeah but no but the, the whole the whole time you're attributing you know evil powers to certain things and you got your flesh in which you, you say you think it is a reference to the corporal flesh but you also have the devil the, you know they say the world the flesh and the devil and then you have the, the mind of Christ and you have this new man that's there that it's just, it's extraordinarily complex. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that if you're trying to navigate that for several years, you don't just, okay, it's false. And now you have to, oh, I'm just one mind. <laughs> you know, you left the door, you close the door. And then you're like, now you have to suddenly snap out of this really convoluted, uh, war that you're having with yourself yeah and and, and and wake up and realize it's just you you know yeah. here yeah it's, it's i don't know what well, do you one, think one thing i want to say one thing i want to say jay what to you know just going back to even mentioning that passage about keeping every thought captive i mean people might think like well what's what's wrong with that right that sounds like a good thing right and and i i think people are hmm. might be understanding how a misunderstanding how even a passage that seems innocuous like that um you know there is a lot of underlying things that happen when you really take that in deeply and um you know we're taught as believers that god is omniscient he's omnipresent yeah. he knows every thought right that you have every desire and but i think i think that's where the pathology becomes even worse because mm -hmm. sure you might have that belief and it's hard to even comprehend that to to a degree to a large degree but you inadvertently become your own thought police yeah right 
I mean, it's like you, you, you've actually, what you've done is actually you've taken on the persona of God mm -hmm. in a way, and you've imposed that on yourself. Yeah. So um, there's that, you know, and, and, you know, part of that, the whole, the dynamic nature of how these self-inflicting harm that you do, right? Like we, you know, it, we, we can talk so much about it and there are so many ways that it can manifest and um and i and i think the audience has you know is very well you know informed about their own experiences and you know and at some point i think part of my decon deconstruction process or even processing all this after leaving the faith is that i'm still doing that work 12 years later you know yeah um I, I feel like i'm in a much better place now but hmm. um but it it's it's still a constant struggle to kind of because we're, we're constantly deconstructing our own right yeah. psychology too it's not just the yeah. doctrines and, and the teachings but yeah um, i think that all well plays, I, I, you know, I think yeah. even in what you just said i don't know I, we don't realize how the language even trips us up because yeah. you said it just now and i say it often but you don't, I don't even know if you realize it, but you said leaving the faith as if it's yeah. the only faith as opposed to leaving a faith. You a know faith. what I mean? <laughs> right? right? <laughs> we don't we don't realize we we still yeah. hold the faith the definite that we article. Held. Yeah, the definite article. Yeah. We still think the faith that we held is the only faith. So we're still all it's almost like we're we're conditioned to still uphold it even when we're deconstructing because we're calling it the faith. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And, and yeah, obviously suppressing many... the truth and, and, and wickedness <laughs> and ungodliness. You know? <laughs> well, I, 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 th I think what's interesting about your observation is that maybe in some ways we can kind of help each other. Right. Mm. Even in as we're doing this podcast, it's like you can kind of catch each other yeah. doing this stuff. Yeah. And it's yeah. like you don't have to say you know, that think about the word ungodliness i just that's just it's such a ridiculous word right <laughs> like like ungodliness un, unsmurfishness or like like if you, if you like swap out god for another like undragonliness it's like what <laughs> like godliness what are you talking it's, about <laughs> it, it, it's kind of like the word nasty you know my partner and i were laughing the other day at how funny the word nasty is and it's kind of yeah. like in a, in a similar way it's like it's just it's ridiculous <laughs> but it's like everybody is sober face when they're saying the word and it's like literally nonsense like <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah but let's get into this i'm, I'm, I'm yeah I'm let's get into it. I, want, I want to dive into this yeah let's dive into this so uh what i'm going to do first is I, you know, for anybody out there who might benefit from this, let's kind of define what religious trauma is. Mm. So I'll take a stab at it. So I, I would say re re religious trauma occurs at, at any points, you know, any point in a person's life when they experience something uh, profoundly stressful, degrading, mm. uh, feeling of abuse, or not feeling, being subjected to abuse, or even psychological abuse. Um or any other experience, whether bodily, psychologically, emotionally, is is damaging. So, um, and and that you know, you know, you can call it, you can call the emotional even spiritual, right? I, you know, for me, I don't really adopt that word, but mm. that can be another aspect. If if you still kind of believe in some kind of spiritual thing out there, um, you can definitely include that as well. And lastly, uh, people have also experienced sexual abuse. Uh, of some kind uh, so hold on from... in your definition of of religious trauma you talked about the things that could be traumatic but in mm -hmm. your definition I'm, I'm waiting for you to tie it into religion that so uh that's right it's all contingent on mm -hmm. uh, a religious experience or okay. a religious uh setting mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and or influence gotcha uh so by no means am I saying that this is, uh, you know, an authoritative, like, you know, like this is the categories necessarily to like how I define them. This mm -hmm. is literally based on kind of my, uh, kind of research on the internet and maybe consolidating some of these categories together. Um, so, so don't take that this is some kind of like clinical, like, you know, official thing, but I think it's more in the realm of the practical and uh talking about in a way that can be helpful and that we can 
uh, have a meaningful conversation around. So, um, mm. so let, I'll just kind of start with, you know, categories of religious trauma mm. in, in relationship to the religious, religious experience. Um, let's start with the first one, self-hatred. Mm. So how do I define this, right? Mm. Well, uh, some religions like ours, uh, the ones we were a part of, uh, kind of rest, you know, rest on this idea of that we are inherently evil, mm. uh, untrustworthy, unworthy of love, in a mm. sense. Um, other people can experience this in a way where they feel like they're marginalized in the community, to some degree, discriminated against some, you know, level of, uh, I should say, stress or, or harm done, it could be either emotional or physical. Mm. But what can result from self hatred is things like very low self esteem, depression, self harm, and, mm. you know, in, in worst case, suicidal ideation. Mm. Um, Would you add so, into that, just sort of believing that you don't deserve good or that you deserve right. the worst, or you deserve bad things to happen to you? Yes. Um, mm. And I think for mm. me, at least, uh, kind of one small thing that I can share about me is that mm. um, wow. I think one of the hardest things that I've felt as a Christian, which kind of played a little bit into how I was raised a little bit. And, you know, I, I, I was in a somewhat troubled home and when when you when you're raised in kind of a troubled home a little bit, um, single parent family, you're already kind of dealing with these self esteem issues, mm -hmm. and then when you go into a religious community, you feel so accepted, right? Initially, at least, mm -hmm. and maybe maybe for a lot of it, but then you're hearing these messages from God telling you that mm -hmm. you're a sinner, you know, you 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 uh, you deserve hell. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that kind of, you know, I'm still today, I'm still kind of unraveling a little bit about like what has, you know, yeah. what really that, that has done to me. Mm. Um, but for me, I did, yes, I, I did experience some depression growing up, uh, never to the point of any kind of suicidal ideation, but mm -hmm. um, a huge, huge impact on my self-esteem, mm. uh, which I still work on today. So um, mm. any, any thoughts on this, guys, before kind of we could jump on to the next or um i i when i think about that uh i know very many times i have to catch myself because in some of my best moments i feel guilty for feeling good like i have i never forget uh well i do forget who it was i think it was either chuck swindoll or 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 charles stanley one of those guys but they were talking about just how depraved, how sinful they are. And he said, I have to repent of every good deed I do. And as a Christian, I thought that was so spiritual and so right. Because the, the thinking is because even when I do good, I'm sinning. There's pride, there's self-serving. There's, there's always some way to turn it back around and feel shitty about yourself even when you're doing something. So, so now when I do good, when I feel good, when I laugh at a joke too hard, I catch myself like, like I don't deserve to be feeling that happy without God. And so I think I, I, I can relate to that self-hatred though. I would never call it that. I thought as a believer, it just was a very accurate view of who I am. I'm this, I'm this worm. I'm this, this creature that how, how, how dare I? have a moment of, of joy that I'm not inviting my creator into. Um, so that, that, that speaks to me. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think uh, that is, can be a hallmark of depression, right? When, um, when something good happens to you mm -hmm. or when uh, uh, there's something to be, to feel good about, and you, you're just kind of unable to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. And that inherently comes with, um, you know, the emotional conditioning that has occurred. And, and I think when you are 
going through it personally, day mm -hmm. in and day out, it kind of robs you of that joy, it kind mm -hmm. of robs you of that, uh, you know, feeling good about things. Yeah, that, that I don't, I don't let it like I don't, I don't give right. it much room when it pops up. Right. You know, I, I beat it down, but I, I yeah. catch myself because it, it does creep up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's hard. Yeah, it's a, it's a struggle. It's like, it's, you kind of have to, there's the practical tools you have to learn, right, in order to kind of overcome that. And <laughs> now I'm know. taking every, I'm taking every Christian thought captive. <laughs> right. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I like that. Yes. It's really good. Yeah. Romans, yeah. Romans uh, 60, we talk about um, our old, um, the old man or the old self being crucified with Christ, if you recall that. Mm. Um, and it's like they introduced you to themes and ideas or concepts of there being multiple yous in you. Mm. That after you leave Christianity, you you don't you're you're not ridded of that notion immediately because as Brady just described it, he's now dealing with the real now whether or not there were multiple people use in you before it was introduced is a whole other story altogether that's something to be examined hmm. but now that they introduce the concept to you when you leave christianity now you actually have to like hmm. get you have to actually somehow suppress this former your you you know hmm. so like you know whereas i i just wonder how it felt for people who never had themselves split or bifurcated in such a way where they yeah. thought of themselves as being two yeah. first two people, like mm -hmm. they're being like these yeah. different two minds. Yeah. Uh, how does the life feel to never have that concept mm -hmm. in in yeah. and to just live? Yeah. And it, and to take just ownership for your own thoughts and yeah, I mean, I guess you know, it's just an interesting thing. I don't know. I, that's not really anything adding much to it. It's just no, no, no. It's adding a lot. In fact, um, you, you know, uh, for the audience, I think you might see that as we kind of go through this progressively, that you're going to see some common themes that are happening, and it's actually really good to be aware of that and take note of it. So, um, yeah, no, that that was that 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 was really helpful. Um, okay. I think I think we'll go on to the next um, number two shame. So, hmm. how am I going to define shame? So, I would say that shame is the negative emotion and action um, that one has to conceal or hide themselves to, to in one degree or another. Hmm. Um, now, a lot of religious communities, they'll use shame as a way to, right, influence and control you, um, which, you know, sometimes I kind of wonder, right, how certain people of a certain political persuasion are so obsessed with control. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there's some, you know, a relationship there a little bit that's bleeding and, you know, extending into their you know, other parts of their lives. But um but learning to kind of, instead of learning to kind of accept responsibility for mistakes or extending enough level of compassion and forgiveness, um, mm. what you end up doing is you just, you, you hide, you bottle up, you, you don't, you don't, you really don't want to see mm. your community the way that you really are or that you feel that you really are. Mm. Um, I can relate to this for myself because um, I think I didn't want people to hmm. view, you know, uh, you know, like I, I didn't act out certain uh, sexual things, right? Hmm. Like when I was growing up as a young guy and things like that. So, you know, I had to kind of compensate for that, right? Like, you know, I, there was some porn use, there was, you know, masturbation, those things. But those things were like, of you know, that's a shame, right? Mm. It's like, I don't want anyone to know that side of me. Mm. Um, and I think it's no secret that that's tends to be what a lot of Christian guys struggle with, um, you know, growing up. So, but 
there are other aspects of shame where um, I was ashamed that I didn't do my devotions every day, mm. right? <laughs> uh, I yeah. wasn't ashamed. I was ashamed that I didn't pray, mm. you know, three times a day. Mm. Um, I was ashamed that I didn't read my Bible enough. I was ashamed, you know. Didn't share I, the I knew faith that, enough. Yeah, there's n- enough faith, right? Enough faith, enough, you know, am I believing enough, right? Um, you didn't want people to see the amount of unbelief you had. Mm. Uh, now, some people might respond, well, okay, but our church isn't like that, right? Mm-hmm. And for me, I can tell you, well, I thought I wasn't in a church like that either, mm. <laughs> right? <laughs> Especially when I was a Reformed Christian, you know, mm. going to a church that teaches grace through grace, mm-hmm. grace alone, through faith alone. You come to the Eucharist, you, you know, take your blood and body of Christ and all that, right? But then I, I felt that that's that was the place to be, right? Mm-hmm. But then I still struggled with this. Mm-hmm. Why Why is that, right? Mm-hmm. And why, well, you know, maybe this is something you can kind of relate to and you can ask that question why. Mm-hmm. And it's good to ask that question why. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking um, I can relate to everything that you talked about there. Um <laughs> I don't even know if this is worth sharing. Um, hmm. No, no, no pressure, Brady. Right? Yeah, it's, yeah. You know, this, this is a safe place. But you know. I'm thinking about a time where I, I, I did try to confess to a, a fellow Christian brother um, that I was struggling with a certain, certain sin, struggling with uh, masturbation, um, and I have no idea why. This dude just laughed. Mm-hmm. And I was like, damn, like, yo, I'm I'm doing the quote unquote the Christian thing. I'm, you know, we're supposed to be confessing our sins to one another. Yeah. Dude just like and he apologized. But I never confessed another thing to him again. Like it instantly. And and somebody could say, well, not all Christians would do that. Well, that's not a Christian thing to do. But the, and I think, I think one, two, and three, well, I guess these all kind of tie in together here because mm-hmm the shame sort of pushes you inward so that why is it that you can't share with people that you haven't been praying? You haven't been reading your Bible as much as you think you should. You haven't been sharing your faith as much as somebody else. Why? Well, because there's this sense in which aren't you, aren't you supposed to have been made better? Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you've been made better, then why are you still doing these things and not doing all the things that you should be doing? Which can kind of tie into the perfectionism, right? Exactly. I don't. I don't know if you guys saw that. Um, this is a clip of a guy. He's like a news reporter in Europe. I think it's. I think it's actually some sort of talk show, and there was some person who had some terrific injury or def- birth defect where they talk with a really high pitched voice, and the 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 host yes. hears the person and the person's like, hey, hey, hey. and the guy starts laughing. Like when you were telling that story, it reminds me because the person had a genuine mm. issue, like a, you know, mm. I think it was a deformity or something. And he was laughing uncontrollably. And, and, and you know, the humor that people is just in this guy. I think they say he later got fired or whatever. But mm. it, it's like, yeah, just imagine taking your serious, your serious concerns about sanctification and you're taking this thing very serious and you're sharing this really kind of embarrassing yeah. truth about yourself with someone mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. imagine the, their impulse being to laugh mm-hmm. and even if they apologize it's like you know apologies they're not appropriate for certain mm-hmm. things you can't apologize <laughs> you can't apologize <laughs> yeah, to me for laughing at my pain and trauma like it's mm-hmm. you right. can say you're sorry but it's like no you really meant that that's why you laughed mm-hmm. you know that that's you understand what I'm saying? Like, yeah. there's a sense in which, there's a sense in which, yeah, I understand why you would never share a thing with that person again because you know how they view you. Mm. So, um, yeah, obviously they thought it was a funny thing, and th- they only regret you being aware of that by via their laughing at you. Well, you know what's interesting though, I shared this with this person for accountability. Yeah, and not only did the person laugh mm-hmm. and apologize. But the person never held me accountable. Like the person never brought it up again. God, I, I I think, like I was, <laughs> God, I don't know if I should just say, 
I was in ministry with this person for over a decade. Oh, wow. <laughs> and maybe, maybe I won't put that part on air, but, um, but the person never brought it up again. And so, but I wonder to what degree, like, even that person maybe felt a little shame. Like there's the shame exactly. of maybe they don't even want to bring it up, not because they're doing yeah. it too, but just they don't want to have the shame of hearing that their their <laughs> Christian brother is struggling with this. So you're both right. ashamed. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like you, maybe you have have experienced that as a Christian, where I have. Yeah. You know you should you should hold someone accountable, but even yeah. bringing the thing up, it's like I don't want to embarrass them, so I'm not going to bring it up. <laughs> you know, what yeah, I mean? that's the problem with the accountability culture that was being pushed. Yeah. I don't know. For the Christians who are in there now, they'd be like, what are you talking about? You're talking about the Stone Age stuff. Maybe the Christians have moved past it. But when I was there, there was a such thing as basically a, a culture of accountability. It was like, mm -hmm. confess your faults one to another and so forth. And you would just, it has a way, this is, it makes leaving that much more traumatic because you've opened up parts of your life that you would under no other circumstance would these people know some of these things about you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, now you're mm -hmm. leaving. These people hate your guts. <laughs> and and some of them have the ammo. They're, well, I always knew he wasn't, you know, like he was doing this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so forth. Mm -hmm. Like so the, those who, who actually have the, the dark, deep secrets could then say, well, you know, he was struggling with such a, and they have it and you're on the outside now, you know, yeah. and, Believe me, this is a real thing. This yeah. is a real thing, I think, for first. Look, these are human beings. People mm -hmm. will, they will try to take your darkest secret and throw mm -hmm. it up in your face or try to use it against you after you leave. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I don't know. It's just a thought I was just having because yeah. I, I remember so, leaving and that was one of the things. I Some of these guys knew mm -hmm. I, had, I would weekly share some of the deepest things, stuff you never share with adult people. Like, yeah, you keep it to yourself, but the church <laughs> encouraged you to, to tell these secrets, you know? So, Jay, what I remember years ago, you and I had a conversation about how um, because of this culture of shame and how people are sharing things and uh, they're not, you know, uh, either respected or sympathized with or sympathize with you, the person. Um, I remember we were talking about how pastors also hmm. relate to their congregation in that way. And you recollected some anecdotes about pastors who didn't keep certain co information confidential hmm. about, oh, yeah. you know, what an individual was struggling with. Oh, yeah. And yeah. the amount of pastors damage wives. that does. Pastors, right. Pastors, pastors look, wives. Man, man right. that's a thing. Because the, the, the pastor's so, pillow talking with his wife, and he's just letting it hang out like, mm -hmm. you know, all right, you know, such and such has been going, you know, it's been a stressful day at the office, right. you know, I had to, you know, you, you wouldn't believe what such and such is going through. And, yeah. and the wife was like, oh, no, no, <laughs> no. As soon as she gets out of the bedroom, you know, later on the next day, you know, she's telling one of her friends, next thing you know, you could... Uh, man, hmm. we, we this could be a whole pot. I, I'll never forget. I I ran into someone. Go ahead. What are you saying, Al? No, no. Go ahead. Yeah, finish that. Finish that. I want to hear that. I, I ran into someone who loudly explained something one time when I was like out in public on public transportation, hmm. and it was just like it was like what what I I never <laughs> or the old the, another brother who was an old. I guess he may have been get going senile or whatever, but I was encouraged to, to, you know, he was going to help me with my struggles as an older Christian. This guy would, would run into you in church and be like, are you still struggling with the lust or sexual oh, thing? I, like out loud in so church. It's like, what in the world? <laughs> Man, just no oh, Brady, it's horrible. I, no, I, I, I should be laughing. feeling this, but huh? I... Well, Brady, I, I, I see you're shaking your head. What's going on? Let's hear it. Go ahead, Al. Go ahead. No, so, no I, I shouldn't be laughing, I, but it, it, it's just, I, it's kind of funny because it's it's just, it's a, kind of a Larry David moment, I feel, in some ways, you know, mm -hmm. where, you know, it's just so obviously just really embarrassing and, and just come on, you know, like just have some common sense about, you mm -hmm. know, how people you're, feel. You're and, right. It's, it's you know, Seinfeld. It's like, it's, you're it's sure, a, it's yeah. like. Find an older brother in a church to share your struggles with. He just happens right. to be seen, seen <laughs> senility is set, set in. And, he, <laughs> and he's yeah, like, exactly. are you still so struggling with porn? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I mean, it, so it's partly good that we can laugh about it, but hmm. but yeah, it, it exactly well, uh, it create yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Brady. Um, real quick, I, I wonder to what degree it should it, it also is sort of artificial because on one hand, mm -hmm. Jay Witt, you're saying Jay Witt said these are things you wouldn't share with another adult, but when you when you see certain unbelievers, people who've never had this religious instruction. Mm -hmm. They do talk about some of these things with without any, and they may not shout it, you know, on the bus or whatever, but mm -hmm. they'll they'll talk about things that human beings do, things that human beings get into. Yeah, without, yeah you're without right. any of the shame, without any of the, um, and so you know you have a uh, uh, passage of the, uh, scripture that talk about people glorying in their shame, mm -hmm. but it's like, wait, are you glorying in your shame or are you just being human? Right. And, yeah. And talking about right. human things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. right. I, I guess it's the added level. Well, I mean, no one wants to be in like some co-ed situation, that, like you know, with grandmothers walking around. Hey, right. you're still struggling with the. <laughs> it's like, hey, Jay, what are you still struggling with with, with masturbation? It's like, what, right. brother? Yeah. <laughs> but you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, we're getting lost. Okay. No, no, we're not getting lost at all. This is really good because I think. um this is all to say, and, and I want to highlight to anyone in the audience who has never seen, you know, a therapist or, you know, clinical psychologist, there are, re there are be it's because of this, there are good reasons why there are laws in place that mm. protect your privacy, mm. right? Mm. You know, a therapist cannot divulge any details to anyone else about you can't name you it can't they can't you know they they are bound by law so you know I, you know jay wood and i were kind of asking like why why aren't, why aren't clergy bound mm. to a law in a similar way mm. right they're bound to a higher law <laughs> but that higher law they're apparently not you know mm. doesn't say anything like about a lower law <laughs> like confidentiality yeah mm. right i mean that our, our human laws are doing better than, wow wow you know it's, you know so mm. yeah I don't know. Yeah, but just as an aside, really quickly, any Christians who, you know, you haven't left the faith, I'll just give you some advice as somebody who's who has left. If you're still in the inside, you know, don't find that old guy and share all of your business with them. Like, it's just <laughs> yeah. not a good idea. Just, not a good idea. Just don't do it, you know, just don't do it. You can stay in the faith. That's, you know, it's probably <laughs> a worse idea to stay in the faith, but like, you know, just, <laughs> just save yourself that little, you know, you know, bit mm -hmm. of pain. Yeah. Um, hmm. All right. Let's let's move on to the next. And I I know there's some overlap here, but hmm. we will um some of these some of these categories we can kind of touch a little more quickly uh, mm -hmm. because we but perfectionism right um how would you define it Well, it's it's uh hmm. I guess a tendency in human behavior to try and be flawless to mm. you know to some degree to be performing 100 mm. percent in without any uh yeah you know, without know spot or the, blemish without spot or blemish <laughs> exactly <laughs> and uh what can result from this kind of behavior because god's laws are so high and his laws are so perfect and be holy for i am holy be, be holy for i'm holy well it can company it can be accompanied by you know high levels of anxiety mm -hmm. stress mm -hmm. putting unrealistic goals uh no matter how many times christians will say we're not legalists we're not pharisees we're not saved by our works we're not saved by our works i would turn the mirror right back at you and really have cause you to you know examine your life that's true that wasn't true of me mm. as much as i was a pauline person in my theology um i don't think it's possible <laughs> given mm. uh the conditions and, and the kinds of instructions and and, and the the community the, the air we you breathe mm. you know in, in in as a christian um mm. any any thoughts on that before maybe we can move to the next hyper Hyper vigilance with hyper. Can yeah, you hyper guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hyper vigilance with your um, your motives, which is just like oh gosh, that that can drive a person nuts. It's like you know, it's not just enough to do it 
to do the right thing is like to to do the right thing and not be doing it to earn your salvation, even though you would like to be saved and to just constantly be on that. Yeah, it's like the guys are apologizing for their, like you say earlier, hmm. apologizing for the good stuff they do. He's like, even someone said, hmm. even, uh, I don't know, you know, it'd be interesting, Brady, you're the seminarian. And there is the passage which says, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. And many reformed people took that to literally suggest that even your best deeds are tainted by your sinfulness. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're, you're literally apologizing for, you know, you're repenting for the best stuff that you've done because even that is sinful, right? I mean, yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird seesaw because like you said, on one hand, you could never be good enough mm -hmm. and you're not saved by your works. But then on the other hand, you were saved to do good works. And right. so there's all these good works that were prepared for you, pre prepared in advance for you to walk in and all these kind of things. Um, you're, you're, you're working out your salvation and fear and trembling and all these kinds of things. So it's like, it's that talking out of both sides of your mouth. It's not about what you do, but then if you do nothing, mm -hmm. you've got, you've got no fruit to show. And so you, mm -hmm. where's your fruit? We'll know you by your fruit. Um, but I think we all know the Christians who every once in a while you run across a Christian who they're not glorying in their shame, but at the same time, they will confess how messed up they are. And they kind of get this, this badge for, for owning their mess. Yeah. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know, like I, I'm trying to figure out where is that, where is that fall in this paradigm of the rare Christian who owns his mess, but they only own it. It seems like it's only, it's only okay to own it in very small doses. Right. You own it as you confess it, but you're not right. trying to stay in it. So it's okay. But well, if you, yeah. There's a paradox of the, I mean, as you're, we're talking about this, I'm just getting, I'm, it's bringing it all back to me. Hmm. There were these people who were known for their stellar character hmm. and it was emphasized, it was put in bold face by how sinful they said they were. Like people like Piper, mm -hmm. you know, who people know to be like this holy man. He's he's even confessed that he never looked at any porn. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in a porn obsessed culture like ours, if you get in the mic in the pulpit and say, hey, I've never, like everybody's going to be looking at you like you're <laughs> Moses <laughs> coming off of the mouth with the <laughs> radiant face, right? Right. And then he get, when that guy says, I'm so sinful. I'm just a wretch. You know, it, it, that makes you even more holy. It's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? The more you debase yourself in your description wow. of it. Wow. Go ahead, yeah. go ahead. No, you, you just tied it in because I'm like, where does that play in? Because there's something about you confessing how, how wretched you are that almost makes you more righteous in this kind right. of a community. So exactly. Especially your... when you're righteous, right? Yeah. 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 Hmm. Yeah. So wow. it's like, there's clearly ego at play i would imagine in these dynamics hmm. if you just as an outsider now looking in like there has to be ego informing this you hmm. know the most stellar person you know i'll never forget there was one brother who i could go on forever with these so i need to stop so but yeah <laughs> let's move let's keep it moving <laughs> sounds good so uh jay Witt just broke into hyper vigilism but what more about hyper hyper vigilancy did you want to say because we were we were talking about perfectionism, but it ties in there. Yeah, no, it ties in. That flows right in. This is great. So, well, let, let's define it a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. What some people here might be asking the question: What is hypervigilance? Um, I think the best way is to give an example. Have have is, has anyone here been in a room where you've maybe drawn up some scenarios in your head? about what can go wrong hmm. and you think it right it, it, it's, it's premeditated and then you identify those things in the room and you go and then you try to fix it or fix it in a way where it, you know that problem won't happen right um 
it's not just like risk management, right? Don't mm. think of it that way, but it's, it's think of it as a behavior. Mm. It's, it's, it's this behavior, this impulse that, you know, things can go wrong. Mm. Uh, and you do what you can to fix it. Now, in the context of religion, what does that mean, right? That means, well, in in our circles, we were taught that, you know, God judges us based on our thoughts and desires, mm. our sins. Uh, the consequence of not being in the faith is being cast into hell forever. Um, and it's this high level of anxiety that results from it, 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 it you what you do is you're, you're you're put into this constant state of anxiety about your own spiritual life that bleeds into your own every day um into uh how you relate to other people perhaps um it could be manifested in very different ways um mm -hmm. one thing that i can share and you know without going too much into the detail but um when i grew up when i grew up i had um what made my family tumultuous growing up was because my mother uh had a very terrible relationship with my in-laws particularly my grandfather who was my dad's father mm -hmm. and my dad's father was i have no i have almost no good memory of him i think he was you know I viscerally react when I think about him in, in terms of like, what I mean by that is I, I, you know, I, I really hated him. Mm. I feared him. He was, you know, uh, one of the worst patriarchs that, you know, you could probably think of. Um, he was abusive, not only verbally, he was abusive physically, emotionally. He was very cold. Um, there's only one moment when uh, I don't know if you guys have ever watched the show uh, Better Call Saul, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you remember that one scene. And you could play the scene maybe later, Brady. But um, it's that one scene when he walks in the door of uh, Los Pollos Hermanos, mm -hmm. and he has this kind of like brooding, almost like really cold and you know, he has his like hand behind his back and he's kind of just like walking in. It, it, I mean, everybody felt his presence, right? Mm -hmm. it, everybody turned around and they looked at him and they knew he was someone to be feared. And that was the first moment in, in like television where I felt like that captured my grandfather. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that captured his mm -hmm. kind of menacing broodness that mm -hmm. you can kind of feel whenever he walked in the room. Mm -hmm. And... I had this traumatic experience where when I was five years old, my mother and him got into a big fight and then he kicked us out on the street. Basically mm -hmm. he, he, he said, you know, you, you're going to take your two kids and you guys are going to leave, you know, you can't even take the car. So my mom, I, I have these old memories of my mom mm -hmm. holding my hand and holding my sister, she was the baby. And we had to walk blocks and blocks in order to catch a cab. Mm. so you know we can go to her parents place and that experience traumatized me as a kid as a five-year-old like it was very traumatizing and i don't to i'm still working through that trauma mm. uh, but one of the reasons why i bring this up is because years later when i had to come back and see him and i had to kind of we had this weird arrangement where i would go to school because school was close by to where my grandparents lived. And I would come home to them, right? And then after dinner, I would go back to my mother. And for five years, that was the daily routine. Mm. And every day mm. I would, every day I walked in the house, the moment I walked in the house, I had to greet him. Mm. If I didn't greet him, he would hit me or he would, you know, strike me and yell at me and, you know, punish me somehow. If I didn't wash my hands before a meal, we did the same. Mm. If I didn't uh, use the same in, in Korean, there's a way that you address your elders and it's part of uh, 
in Korean, it's called chonnemal, which is basically a way to address people who are older than you with respect. If I didn't do that just right, mm. I would see as wrath. Mm. So because of this, it created a hypervigilance in me, right? I was, as, as a kid, I had nearly a perfect track record doing mm. this. Mm. Anytime, you know, anytime I would address him, anytime I would come in the house and greet him, I would have to say bye when I left. And... The only times I messed up, what I can only count with mm. one hand. And even then I saw, I saw his wrath. Mm. So if there's any analogy for mm -hmm. God's loss, right, <laughs> you can kind of take that as, as, as a metaphor. And one of the things that I realized, mm. uh, you know, not long ago with my therapist was that when I became a Christian mm. and when I started to go more towards the fundamentalist side. I was at John MacArthur's church for a little while. This strange phenomenon happened because I think being in an environment like that, it taps into that mm. kind of trauma. Yeah. And I think what happened was I mm. felt comforted, mm. right? There was a weird amount of comfort that I had with it because it was so familiar to me. Wow. Wow. The, you, you guys understand how this is so yeah. weird? Mm -hmm. How this yeah. is so twisted? Yeah. I mean, so, yeah, yeah. go ahead. No go, no, go on, go on. No, so, so I, so, hmm. you know, I remember what I loved about John MacArthur's preaching was, you know, I thought that he was expositional, right? I thought that he was teaching you the Bible, but he teaches you a version of Christianity that is, very uh you know it's based in fear it's based in uh mm. you know self-examination mm. are you in the faith yeah. are you you know lordship lordship salvation i'm sure you guys are familiar with all that mm -hmm. There's the gospel according to jesus gospel according to jesus um and then the community there was highly fundamentalist mm. um they wouldn't say that here that's that's the other mm. thing I, I i know some of you might you know, the audience might say, well, they're not technically fundamentalists. Well, we can have that larger debate, but mm. they are, I would, for, you know, simple terms, I, yeah. I would argue that they are. But the amount of people who were excommunicated from the church, mm. the amount of people who are confronted with their sin, mm. you, you, you cannot go a month without hearing about somebody right. who, you know, got, got in trouble. Mm. And Hmm. For me, that was like, that was oddly comforting. <laughs> it, and it, I never, wow. I, I never understood that for a long time. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but eventually, and so just as the last thing I'll say, Brady, before you chime in, I think what eventually led me to the reform camp hmm. was at some point it became unsustainable for me psychologically. Hmm. And I knew that that wasn't the right and healthy way to live. Hmm. And I think that's where I really gravitated towards how you know, Tim Keller and, uh, you know, some certain people in the PCA, uh, how, you know, how, how church would be run and, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, understanding the means of grace more. Yeah. And I, I think, I think, and that's where a lot of transition happened, but I'm still working through that trauma. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, I'm here 12 years later. So yeah. go ahead, Brady. no, I just, I don't have any real thoughts of my own on this other than what you made me think as you were talking. Um, the trauma from your grandfather, like you said, became so normal for you yeah. that it was comforting to find that same traumatizing relationship right. in the church. And now I think that's just, that, that'll that preach. Like there, there's a lot of mileage to get out of that. Yeah. Um, because I'm thinking about people that have had, people that I know that have very strict ideas of God and they're not just getting it from the Bible. Happily, they find things in the Bible that match their own strict father figures that they've had in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but when I, when I hear you talk about hypervigilance, I think two things. I think um, obsession, like there's an obsessiveness there. Mm -hmm. uh, the OCD, like having a checklist. Right. Hypervigilance is having this checklist of did I do this? Did I do that? Did I do this? Did I do that? Because if I didn't, 
then I'm running the risk of upsetting or not pleasing. Um, may, like I said, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Well, you're going to have to do a certain amount of policing to make sure that that's the case. That that opens the door to that hypervigilance. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, well, it, it sounds like what you're saying is vigilance upon vigilance. Yeah. Um, that's where I might, at least according to my therapist <laughs> mm. and according to sources is it's, it's not so much adding, piling on that hypervigilance, maybe adding awareness to yourself, understanding it when it happens. Mm. But I think because it's based in so much fear and anxiety, um, I, I think the general consensus or the general method in how therapists would tell their person, um, their patient, is to latch more onto positive and calming ideas, mm -hmm. things that make you feel good. Um, if you feel this kind of anxiety arising in you, you be aware of it. Yes. In, in that mm -hmm. sense, vigilant. Yes. Be aware of it. But the, but then it's not then to... Right. It's it, we don't want to be John Piper with it. We don't mm. kill it. Right. It's not. No, it's not that mm. it's maybe you let the emotion write itself out or you can so, find other ways to self-soothe. So. Um, so I, I think that's that's where, you know. That in itself is a skill, right? Mm. You, that, that's something you have to build that muscle memory, in, in, you know, in, in, emotionally and mentally in order to do that. Mm. Um, I, and that's, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Jay. What? I, no, uh, go ahead. Finish your thought. Finish your thought. So, so it, 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 it's, it's, it's the antithesis. It really is the antithesis of, of how we're taught, mm -hmm. right? The, you know, the, this, um, feeling good about yourself and doing things that make you feel good or thinking thoughts that make you feel good mm -hmm. there. That's what we've been missing, mm -hmm. uh, largely to a yeah. large degree um that self-soothing process so and and really that that's that's the way to heal that that is a way to heal so we, we can talk about this later mm -hmm. you know in terms of path to recovery but um any any thoughts yeah. Jaywit, before yeah move on yeah no I'll, I'll i'll keep mine brief but uh it was just okay. i'm just thinking i know when I, while i was listening to both you and brady i'm thinking I know there are some Christian that says, ah, see, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's that religion and not that relationship. Mm -hmm. They like the, they like the alliterative quality of that, you know, and for, for you Christian who thinks that you've got something. So that's just understand that that's like, that's kind of like ketchup or sriracha or something like that's, it, it works on everything. <laughs> like you, <laughs> you, can, you can apply Mm. Uh, that's religion and not relationship that's why they invented that alliterative like basically phrase they they, they invented it so it can be used mm. on any number every time you hear something that doesn't scratch your particular itch you can say see there it is that's that's religion it's not relationship mm. uh, and i just challenge you to to, to do a little examining mm. of it's kind of like the the term or the phrase double-edged sword mm -hmm. same kind of thing it's like it's are you what are you even saying that's religion that's not really like examine yourself mm. <laughs> examine yourself to see if you're in the faith yeah. what do you mean when you say that's religion and that's not a relationship mm. isn't the relationship itself based in religion yeah mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it's almost a non-statement and for... isn't the religion how you have the relationship mm -hmm. right yeah mm-hmm but so. I just know a lot of a lot of people like to pit the two against the for the person who does too much mm -hmm. or who feels the I don't know almost this kind of authority that and God is presented as an authority figure in the text. He is mm -hmm. presented that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when a person says I felt that overwhelmingly, I didn't feel the tight bond of a son. They say, well, see, there you go. You were never really a son. You <laughs> had the religion part, and you didn't have the religion. It was like. The Bible is full of that. We constantly refer to God appearing on the mountain. He didn't appear to them, supposedly in the text at least, he didn't appear to them as a loving father. He was thundering, mm -hmm. it was lightning. <laughs> they were he scared the, the crap out of them, you he know. Scared the crap, yeah. 
Exactly. You know, so in the text, and we're told these stories. So if if one person reads the same text you're reading, and, and what they end up having is this authority figure of a father that traumatizes them, don't tell them it's your religion and not relationship. It's not their fault that the, the Bible has been presented to us this way, you know? Hmm. I, it's, just, it's just a thought. Yeah. And, you know, that's it the thing. And I, I think it's, it's some some kind of application to, you know, how, you know, I, I told an anecdote, you know, where, you know, it, it's really complex and people, you know, you, you often wonder why, you know, you've presented, you've spoken to a, a friend in the faith or somebody who's struggling and, you know, they just can't quite get out. Right. And, and I know you guys have both given some, you know, good advice to some of those people, but you know, the, the, the fact that I had comfort in, in living a life of hypervigilance, right. That, that it, it was a safe, it was a way to feel safe. It was a way to feel in control. Right. And that presents a really complicated problem for, you know, someone like me, you know, let's say 20, 20 years ago, mm. you know, I was talking to one of you, you know, now or me myself, right? And um, I don't think I would have been able to process what I've been able to process. Yeah. And, I, and I think for people out there, that's okay. Um, you know, you don't have to feel like I have to figure all this out, right? It took me 20 years to figure this out in, in a way, right? So, hmm. um, yeah, and, I, you know, so... Yeah, it's, it's, it's all I can, say can I that. just plug yeah. on that? Like we we, well, we say this often on uh on exit strategy, but so you see Al saying it, it took him twenty years to process this. It's taken him twelve years to process mm -hmm. that. If you can look ahead and see, man, I'm going to be deconstructing this for for a decade or two or three. We have people in our comments deconstructing fifty years. They left the faith fifty yeah. years ago. And they're still mm. trying to unthink things they were taught for the first oh, 20 years. Richard, man, that I am. First 20 years of their life, things that they were taught. And here they are, 60, 70 years old, still trying to unthink those things because they got in so early in that person's development. Yeah. I say that mm. to say, if you see deconstruction in your future, especially if you see deconversion in your future, don't put off till tomorrow what's going to take you 10 years to deconstruct. Right. Start today. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right, so the next point, um, we're gonna talk about delayed social milestones. Mm. So <laughs> I'm gonna I, I'm gonna relegate this to basically the purity culture. Mm. Uh, you know, I think for just think about you know all of the message we all the what the church tried to tell us right when we were teenagers was. Mm. You know, wait to have sex, wait to have sex, right? You want to, you want to, uh, what was that one campaign they were on? Uh, I can't remember. It was really cheesy. Hmm. Did, what was that? I, I kissed dating goodbye. I kissed dating goodbye. Uh, but then like, don't wait until, like, wait until you're, I can't remember. But yeah, hmm. I kissed dating goodbye is one of them, but that's more about courtship. Well, by the way, he apostatized the guy who wrote that book. Yeah, Josh Harris. Yeah, he apostatized yeah. as well. Um, He's actually, you know, it's interesting. A lot of parallels between you, Brady, because I, I think he came out very publicly and denounced his faith, mm. but really tried to help people that he felt. I think he gave an apology. I, it's been a long time since I read it. Mm. I was already out of the faith by that point, but I remember him saying something along the lines of apologizing to people who he had damaged through the book. Mm, right. Because wow, it yeah. was a really popular book in evangelical circles. Mm. Yeah, it was very popular. Yeah, I, I was a fan of it at some point, mm. uh, too. But, mm. um, but yeah, just going back, purity culture. Um, it's it's the type of culture that <laughs> would inhibit the natural desires and biological things that humans do, right? Mm -hmm. As you're developing and maturing, and for Christians, it's delayed. For people of other religions, it's delayed. Mm. And this makes it even more complex if you are within the LGBTQIA plus category, right? Mm. Um, the, the, the kind of 
delayed milestones that those people have yeah. um, present another challenge. Hmm. Um, so, you know, for me, I, this has definitely impacted me, right? I, you know, um, I think I didn't really have sexual intimacy until, uh, you know, later in my 20s or kind of mid 20s, I mm -hmm. would say. Um, mm -hmm. because I was trying to be, you know, as, as good as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like I haven't really scratched the surface in some ways in terms of understanding how that has impacted me, mm -hmm. but I, you know, um, I mean, that, that's, that's just, you know, I can easily sound like a downer. <laughs> because uh, mm -hmm. i can but i, I don't want to do that uh but can you think of any ways outside of uh outside of sex even though i think there's a lot there well yeah yeah so just think about the the practical things about mm -hmm. having conversations healthy conversations with you know mm -hmm. could you know when i was 18 could i have a really kind of candid conversation with another christian peer at the time it's like mm -hmm. hell no right mm -hmm. Um, I remember, you know, even amongst high school friends, mm -hmm. like, you know, I would, who were having these conversations and they were, you know, largely funny and, you know, playful, right? You, like, like that whole playfulness, that whole, like being able to joke about things, to mm -hmm. joke about sex, to, uh, you know, talk about like, you know, I, I had, I had high school friends who could share mm -hmm. what each other, with each other, what kinds of things that they liked or what things, you know, how to do certain things better. And I totally just kind of ached out on, on those conversations. <laughs> but <laughs> looking back on it, I was like, no, but though they were, you know, there was a part of me even back then was like, oh, it's like, it is funny. You know, it yeah. is kind of fun to talk about. Mm -hmm. But I had to, I had to like hold that in. I yeah. had to, you know. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, you know, so there, there's, there, there's that aspect that, that I think the socialization is, is more than just having that intimacy. It's also right. being in that culture. So, well, I, I'm thinking about it in terms of because even that is still related to sex. I'm thinking about social milestones that don't necessarily have to do with sex at all. Not not, mm -hmm. not just not talking about it, but um, mm -hmm. you're talking about socialization. If you keep yourself back from, you know, you don't want to be you don't want to love the world. So right. like maybe you're not watching certain you're not watching movies. You're not, you know, the the, the Christian college that I went to, we had to sign pledges that said we would not dance, we would not go to movies. Um, there were certain things that we just could not do. And so when I think about social milestones, I just think about just being able to be part of a functioning society. You're not really prepared to uh, to speak about just what's happening in the world because you've been kept from it so much. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And somebody might say, that's a good thing, where you're almost like, <laughs> you're almost like the Amish, you're the spiritual Amish. Um, you may not be, be, you know, in all ways like the Amish, but in some ways you, you sort of are because you're, you're keeping yourself from, uh, from knowing about just whether it be uh, politics or, uh, you know, how social mores are changing or no. things like that. Yeah. No. Yeah, I, it, the only thing I would say is I've said it before. It's worth saying here. It's interesting that the category uh, of purity is attached to sin, um, and that just keeps you on your knees perennially because you, yeah, uh, you're never going to get over. You're never going to be this quote unquote pure person. I mean, we just know that. That's 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 literally your biology. That's your hormones, especially your if hormones, you're a young man. Yeah. Mm, right. um so some of that is just it's, it's wired you're wired you know it's just your wiring if we didn't have those impulses we'd be less likely to reproduce which is the reason why we've evolved to have them is to create another generation mm. um so trying to suppress that impulse is you're you're literally trying to undo evolution and we'll see how lucky <laughs> you are at that task it's not gonna yeah it's not going to happen, you know, exactly. So, but what's going to happen when your religion takes that impulse and attaches the category of sin to it mm. is you're going to perennially think that you're the worst human being. 
And you're going to have every reason to think that you need a substitutionary human sacrifice mm. in your place. Um, I, I emphasize human there. I think I think that's how I'm going to refer to the substitutionary atonement from now on, since Christians <laughs> like like to use that on the Canaanites. They they did engage in human sacrifice. Well, so do you. You guys believe in a human sacrifice. <laughs> Hmm. all right for the next point um lack of boundaries so people might be kind of asking why this is here let, let me kind of explain it so has anyone here been in you know involved in church ministry right where you felt like the pastor or somebody else just demanded so much of your time and you felt that you couldn't say no hmm. right i've seen that, it happen that, it's that, never that. happened to me but i've seen it happen <laughs> that's happened to me uh mm -hmm. that I, I i tend to be someone who tends to be kind of agreeable and hmm. um conscientious as well but um i'm kind of one of those profiles where yeah people will take advantage of me pretty easily so um for me, this has been kind of descriptive of me. It, it's really baked into me as, as as in my personality, so I don't I don't necessarily blame it on hmm. the religion itself. But I think religion often treads into these uh, boundary issues often because of the fact that you know it, it, they they depend on. Uh, you know, the congregation yeah. to, to do yeah. a lot of heavy lifting. So, yeah. but here there, that's, that's kind of the soft side. I think the lack of boundaries also play into similarly how we've talked about shame, self-hatred. Um, have you ever thought about the fact that God telling you hmm. about your life, what you need to do, all the wrong things in your life is hmm. in a sense, a violation of your boundary, right? Um, hmm. And it becomes more uh, pronounced in the real world because you have your small group leaders who know about your life, who get into your business hmm. about your personal matters, pastors who get into your personal business, often when you never ask them to, hmm. right? Hmm. Yeah. They know God's will for your life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what your career should be, who you should marry, who you shouldn't marry. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. I, I remember my uh, college pastor at Grace, he, he, what he loved to do mm. in his sermons is point out behavior that he felt was um, ungodly. Mm. Yeah, what he called, he loved to call it, are you teachable, right? That's that's the quotation that he used mm -hmm. a lot. It's so cultish. This is mm. very cultish, yeah. But I, mm. I remember a lot of the examples he would give. Now, thankfully, he didn't name names, mm. but he would he would point out scenarios where he was, you know, one on one with another college student, and and he would just talk about how what not to do is for them to say. For, for them to be assertive about them, their own lives, right? Mm. About assertive about like, mm. well, you know, this is my choice. This is what I want to do. Or um, this is none of your business. Or, you know, I don't think God cares about this in my mm. life. Or I don't think, I don't, I don't, I don't think he should, you know, I should be judged for this. And that was always pointed out as being, the way not to be right to to be that was the ungodly way to behave hmm. um so what what he's basically doing he's he's actually he's he's being terrible as a as a person doing this but he's also teaching the congregants hmm. to let people cross your boundary like yeah. it, it, it gives them license to do it hmm. basically yeah um any thoughts on that? Before we go mm -hmm. on? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure everyone... Everyone can... <laughs> everyone's yeah. listening, thinking of their own examples of how they've seen this or experienced how they, Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. 
Be sure to drop those in the in the in the comments under the video, by the way. Very yeah. eager to to see some of those. Yeah. Okay. Confess Sorry. confess your former sins yeah. <laughs> to one another. You don't, you don't have to do that. So you don't, yeah. you don't have we're to not going to overstep your boundaries here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So loss of community. Um, that is I'm sure many people can relate to this. Mm. Um and I think this is this can go both ways in terms of you know church life as well as people you know with family and friends and you know at some point it, 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 you I I I'm standing here twelve years out and I think it's impossible to avoid this uh, if with anybody who is in the church or has to has decided to leave the church um and i think this is one of the things where it is lower on the list but in some ways it should be higher because i think this is where a lot of damage is done um where you know you'll lose contact with people uh people will you will be alienated uh by community um what the end result is however uh, for you know, however this may takes form, right? The lost community is you experience loneliness and isolation, mm. um, and building that back, especially being post deconversion, is really hard. Um, mm. Anybody who knows that, you know, unless you go back to school or you mm. join some other type of community out there, it's really hard. Yeah. Um, I, I remember, uh, not, I remember I, the other day I was watching Matt Dillahunty, um, talk about the study, uh, survey and, mm. uh, he talked about how, what one of the, one of the things that the atheist community needs to improve on. Right. Um, because what's high on the list of, of the survey that, um, recorded what was most missed when they deconverted. Mm. number one at the list was community wow so mm. um and mm. he, he was kind of admonishing that like yeah this is yeah we need, we need to do better with this mm. <laughs> that that's a real that's a real pain point um mm. but th th this is complicated right because i think it, in one sense there are people who do benefit from the church community right mm. they're they're actual practical benefits uh, that can be seen and we've talked about this before um so i'm not going to say that this is like it, it's it's really hard to draw lines between like what is a net good and a net bad you know uh when it comes to this like despite the fact that we've talked about a lot of like toxic cultures within the church mm -hmm. there there there's still at least a community right that <laughs> people can you know, socialize and, and become friends mm. with, and, you know, there is benefit to that. You know, I, I'm not mm. going to, you know, be yeah. unreal about it. Um, you know, it's probably better to have a dysfunctional relationship than to be in a relationship. Now there's an asterisk to that, right. That, you know, um, it depends on what the dysfunction is. Wait, can but, you finish what you were saying? You said it's probably better to be in a dysfunctional relationship than what? Then, then, then to be completely isolated, to be completely. Mm -hmm. I don't know about. I don't know about that. Well, so we can we can agree to disagree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but that that's where I think I I, mm -hmm. I put a hard asterisk. Mm -hmm. Okay, because it really depends. And mm -hmm. well, yeah, like you said, um, on what the dysfunction is. On what the dysfunction is. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And religious dysfunction. That's a pretty. That's a pretty big one. So, mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on there before we go on? Well, I'm just thinking about how that candle burns on both ends. I mean, I'm thinking about my experience yeah. and why this uh, happens to be traumatic for other people, because depending on what age you become a Christian, like if you're raised in the uh, church, you know, four mm -hmm. or five years old, maybe that's the only community you ever knew. And so, yeah, you leave the faith at 30, 40, 50 years old, you lose a lot. But if you're like me, I became a Christian in my late teens. I left a community to become a Christian. 
I left my unbelieving friends and even some unbelieving family members alone so that I could become part of the Christian community. So that's traumatic. But you get over that because you're embraced by this whole new community. Then decades go by, and now you're leaving this community, and now you're remembering that. Who did I, who, where were my friends? Oh, it's those people I left way back there. Mm. Now they've mm. all gone off and they're living different lives yeah. and married, and you don't know what happened to them. I had a best friend before I left the faith. I mean, I'm sorry. I had a best, I had a best friend before I became mm -hmm. a Christian. And me and that person, we grew apart because of my, my faith. What's funny yeah. is, Decades later, now I'm leaving the faith, and now that person's becoming a more serious Christian. Um, so it's like, I don't know, I think that it burns on this end. Yeah. You leave the community, and now that you are no longer a Christian, now you're losing this community. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that, that's extremely traumatic. Um, and I don't know, like, uh, I don't know if it's my age or my stage of life. But I do look at my, I spend a lot of time alone, but I don't mind it. Like, I'd rather be alone than have a community that's based on a lie. So, yeah. yeah. And that's not to say that I'm totally alone. I mean, I've got you guys, I've got other, you know, groups of people that I, I get together with, of different interests that I'm a part of, that I that I yeah. have. Um, but it's definitely, definitely nothing like it was when, I was getting together with people on Sunday and on Wednesday night and right. if a new movie came out, I'm going to see it with them. And, you know, it's, it's not that anymore. Yeah. There, I, I think what comes with it is an incredible amount of sadness. Mm. Um, but if we were to do it any other way, I wouldn't change it. Yeah. Right. I wouldn't change. I, I, I would rather be where I am. Yeah. Well, well, I think we we ought to we ought to take this to heart here because I don't know if you guys realize this. There there are a few people, quite a few, who look forward to our podcast, our mm -hmm. lives on Tuesday night because mm -hmm. they say we're creating a community for people that after they've deconverted, they don't have it anymore, and so they mm -hmm. look forward. They look. I feel bad. Jay Witt tried to get me to do this, and I I feel bad about it, and I shouldn't. I guess. He wanted me to do more lives. Like there was one time we were going to do a live mm -hmm. on Sunday and then turn right back around and do another live on Tuesday. And I was like, just so you guys who are watching know, I was like, no, I don't want our viewers to feel like we're asking too much of them. They got to show up on a <laughs> a Sunday, then turn right back around and show up on a Tuesday. Don't I don't want to be, I don't want to be greedy <laughs> with their time. Yeah. I want to respect their time. I don't want them to see us going live and feel like. Oh, let me go and give them a pity watch. Or I, I, I have to counter that with the fact that for for some people, they look forward to these things because this is where they refine community since they they lost it in losing their. All right. So, <laughs> number eight, sexual dysfunction, um, which is. Don't you feel like we've kind of addressed that a little, or no? We, we kind of addressed speaking? it, but I but there's another angle. Okay. I, can, mm -hmm. I can talk about so I, I, this is what you're gonna I, have to put the x rated on this pod <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna have to have like three x's up on the joint uh, <laughs> no, but, um, all right so so the, the, it, it's an extension of the you know uh the delayed milestones yes the social milestones however i think i think it's worth mentioning to talk about it specifically because because of the purity culture and because of the overemphasis of having sex when you're married mm. um, and the fact that we live in a generation where people are getting married much later, uh, mm. which you can debate is part of the problem or not, but I, I don't think it really is, uh, you know, would, would solve any problem necessarily. But what I, what I, what I want to, I think what's interesting about the sexual dysfunction part is that because there is so much repression sexually, right, from your own biological impulses and being able to kind of live a social life where, you know, you can meet women and men and, um, you know, young adults, explore, young adults, yeah, and explore things. But what, what, what ends up happening, I think, with a lot of people in religion or uh, in cultures that are suppressing or it's based in fear is that 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 exploring 
that you kind of do as a young person mm -hmm. and even even older right it's <laughs> never too late i guess but you, you you're never really understanding yourself you're actually not understanding what turns you on i think I, I think i'm gonna enter in a little slight objection here okay yeah go ahead yeah go ahead little pushback just because sure uh it seems i i, I hate just shooting off the hip like this but okay it's been many years and i've um i've read things online and so forth so i mean take it for whatever it's worth but i've seeming i've learned at least i think years ago that it seems that christians aren't having much less sex than non-christians <laughs> they're just a okay lot, uh, so i i have i have a re rebuttal to that but yeah go ahead keep going okay yeah. i will i'll make it yeah. short then okay they just apparently are far more irresponsible um, mm -hmm. which is part of the reason why in the right. Bible Belt, them fighting against uh, abortion rights and stuff is really just the hairy situation because yeah. also there's the, the situation where STDs and STIs and stuff are, mm -hmm. you know, transfer uh, very commonly in these areas because, yeah, because of the, st the stigma, maybe they, they're not taking extra precaution, but they're still doing it and stuff as much as people who are not Christian. Mm -hmm. so, I, I, so I don't know if a, a person being a Christian is a more signifier that they're going to be less likely to have premarital premarital or extramarital sex. In fact, I think adultery and premarital sex are probably at least as common, if not more, among Christians. Right. But I think so that plays I, into the point. But go ahead, go ahead, Al. Yeah, yeah no, so, so I, I think the response to that is that on, on, a, on a bigger level, is that yes the the statistics, statistics show that they are having sex outside of marriage or before marriage i should say or um no no it, i think it, both it, are true what you were just saying i think they're it, committing adultery just as often as non-christians oh yeah yeah abs absolutely absolutely but i think i think the price that they pay that they're paying comes psychologically because um they're most likely in you know they have a kind of dirty view of sex, mm. right? Mm -hmm. um, the the amount of guilt that they're like, like, you know, they're yeah, they're engaging with it and and it's pleasurable, but they feel bad about themselves. They, it, it's that inner inward. Uh, uh, no, it's not like sex positive voice. culture. It's not it's not sex positive culture, and when when it's plagued with that kind of a mindset, then what's going to happen, right? You, you're actually you don't have a positive view of it, obviously, but hmm. what you miss out on is that kind of free exploration that, hmm. you know, younger people tend to do, right? Um, to really, to really see your sexuality in a very positive way, to think about the things that turn you on, to think about, in, like, exploring that or, you know, and exploring it with somebody You're going to have to, like, right? you're going to have to play, like, some 70s kind of, like, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> the seventies, like you know, uh, music there. Why it's like you know the things that turn you on, and it's like you know <laughs> suddenly the Anchorman music comes on in the middle, you know, the flutes or whatever. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think what's inadequate with uh, how Christians have talked about it a few times. Mm -hmm. um, I remember R.C. Sproul mm -hmm. criticizing that the the culture kind of views sex as like performative right um i remember hmm. what was it i remember tim keller talking about sex and marriage and they're talking about it in terms of like it's this kind of grand spiritual thing that you know two people can share this intimacy and which is not necessarily wrong but no it, driscoll Driscoll <laughs> went. Uh, he went. He went full like song. He I think he did a whole Song of Solomon series that was just, like super, he, super controversial. Well, he he commended anal sex to his yeah, yeah. Too, as well. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, that's right. Yeah, but all, all all I'm saying is that that because sex my has wife become... is hot. She's hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He would all, he, you know he would be going on about how hot he thought his wife was. It's like right, gosh. right, right. Mm. Um. So the, the the point being, right, the dis dysfunction comes from this very kind of pathological approach to your sexuality, 
right? Whether whether mm -hmm. it's going to be on the small scale of feeling guilt about it from, you know, if, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're in relationships to elevating it to this height that is just seems like unattainable or mm. unrealistic for a lot of people <laughs> there's nothing in between there's nothing in between mm. and there and there's nothing to feel positive about uh only in this kind of narrow sliver of of mm. your experience as a human being mm. so that that that's that's all i'm going to say about it yeah. um all right so the last the last point is it, it's a very specific point and um i feel like maybe not everyone can relate to this in some ways but Anyone who experiences trauma in general, and let's say something like religious trauma, um, hmm. it can make decision making really challenging uh, because depending on where your background is, you might come from a church where they stress doctrine very hmm. uh, prominently, as well as the church hierarchy. And what ends up happening is you become captive to that. and you have a hard time making independent decisions. Um, hmm. I know for me, I, I used to struggle a lot in my 20s about, you know, certain decisions that I was making, whether it be kind of like where I was, everything minute down to my finances, mm -hmm. right? In terms of like, are you giving, right? To everything up to, um, my daily kind of routines to hmm. uh, my own spiritual life. And, and then even just like deciding on where to kind of where to live and where hmm. to, you know, do I, I need to be near a church community, you know, a reformed church community. I need to be, um, hmm. you know, plugged in and just, just every aspect of your life seems to be kind of guided with, hmm. you know, what you what you're taught religiously so it made you know it took me a while to really become i still get anxiety i think about when i make certain decisions mm. that i think comes from that um but sometimes i really had to contend with and, and for the last 12 years it's like it's like i want to make a decision that feels good and feel okay about it and be okay about it right that's first number one but number two um just having the freedom to make independent decisions not based in doctrine or lies mm. right not not based in this kind of yeah fabrication or infra you know the the infrastructure that that the structures you put in your place to get rid of that mm -hmm. and then to kind of start new start fresh but then now you have to start to build in in that wisdom yourself and to yeah figure things you know um hmm. when, when you experience a traumatic when you go through traumatic experiences when you kind of live that day in day out um and then to unlearn that yeah that you know is, is by no means you know easy to do but Hmm. Um, but it's but it's because we lived in day in day out we yeah. kind of built those habits so um so that that's that's kind of my comment there it makes me think of nietzsche right nietzsche's uh uh the madman who goes around saying where's god where's god uh, we've we've killed god we don't recognize we killed him and in his uh soliloquy when he's talking about what it's like to have killed god he's talking to a group of atheists and he says to them We've unchained the earth from the sun. And he says, having unchained the earth from its sun, where are we moving now? Yeah. Aren't we aren't we constantly going sideways, forwards, backwards? Like we're not tethered to anything. And uh of course Nietzsche is kind of speaking tongue in cheek here, but he's also warning society, yeah. like, if we're going to do away with God, we do have to kind of grow a pair and we've got to become our own sources of yeah. what's what's grounding us what are we using to base our morals on what are we using to base our this you know our ethics and our, our where we're going our purpose and where we're heading our direction we've got to become that for ourselves and for very many people that is a traumatic thing to think okay if god's not my center anymore what is that going to be 
Um, so yeah, I, I could definitely see how that could be traumatic. I find myself, I know when I was a Christian, I could make a lot of decisions pretty easily. One decision I could not make was about getting married. I dated very many women, was in love with a few, but was always afraid to, to not be in God's will when it came to that particular issue. And so having deconverted, I don't spend my time thinking about the will of God anymore, but I do sometimes have this anxiety of like, even when I try to make plans and if I, if I'm about to say, Hey, next week, I'm going to, I remember the verse that says, you know, don't say tomorrow I'm going to do such and such. Cause you don't know, yeah, right. You should say if the Lord wills and that instinct to say the Lord wills, as opposed to I'm going to, that still rises up and I got to stop myself to like, wait, should I still fight? Should I still be saying, or is it okay to just say, Hey, tomorrow I'm going to, because I know what I mean when I, when I, if I get it tomorrow, then I'm going to, that's what I mean. And it's not presumptuous and it's not wrong to talk about what I'm going to do next year. If I get a next year. Um, so anyway, I just say that to say, I could see how traumatic it can be for the person who's used to running everything by God. And now you don't have that anymore. So this kind of flows into the next point because, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's not, it, you can call it a hallmark of religious trauma, but um, I think in some ways it sums up kind of what we've been saying with each point where there is an individuality that we, we have lost, we, we lost mm. right on a daily basis. Mm. Um, you know, the loss of self and yeah. There was so much talk about faith in Jesus, faith mm. in, you know, the gospel and God's word and his promises. But how many times did you actively try to not have faith in that, but to believe yourself, mm. right? Um, and what I mean by that is it, it, I'm not talking about any kind of pop psych psychology here. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about like, you know, believe in yourself. No, no, no. I'm talking about believing yourself meaning when you have let's say negative feelings about something uh you know you heard a teaching from you know the preacher and and just something in you didn't feel right about it right mm. or um when your boundaries are being crossed uh when you're having all this hyper vigilance about you know, uh, you know, I, I need to live my life this way and I can't do this and I can't do that. Um, any kind of shame, so all the things that we talked about, right? Hmm. It's like, have you take, taken the time to really believe yourself that that's what's hmm. happening, to believe that that's your, what you're experiencing? Hmm. Mm -hmm. And that there's, there's a path, there's a better path to that, but... Hmm. I, I think I think we can all agree, right? That that that's 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 the toll, that's the cost of yeah. kind of being in that milieu for such a long time. Well, um, Jesus supposedly told people that's the cost, right? Mm -hmm. If you if you right, you got to lose your, yourself. You would lose your life for my sake. Mm -hmm. That's when you find life. But if you keep your life, you try to keep your life, then then you're going to lose it. And I I never forget this sense of when I deconverted. Before I did it publicly, there was just a sense of this is my life. I am going to live this life. And I, I felt like I got my me back. And I'll never like it was such a liberating, such a like, yo, here I am. <laughs> you know what I mean? After yeah. years of trying to die to myself, yeah. like I'm living. Oh, this is me. Yeah. I mean, if there's any, if there's any proof that people need to know that you followed what Jesus required of us, right. To deny yourself, take mm -hmm. up your cross. Right. I think there's plenty of testimony <laughs> that, mm -hmm. like, like it, it, in terms of uh, the no true Scotsman fallacy and all that, like thinking that, you know, mm -hmm. you were never a believer. Well, the bread was in the pudding. Mm -hmm. We did it. Yeah. We, we tried to do it. Yeah.
Um, or the pudding was in the bread. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got to. Yeah. So, so that, that pretty much wraps up those points. And, and I, I feel like we kind of just grazed the surface really. And, and I, um, I kind of, I recommend, you know, people who are kind of listening to this, if, if any part of you related to some of this, um, and I'm sure there's lots of people who have more stories to tell and, mm -hmm. um, that there are a lot of resources out there. Um, it's good to talk about these things. It's good to open up. It's good to find people you can trust, hopefully, um, that, you know, you can, they can respect your privacy. They can be compassionate enough to hear you. Um, I, my, my partner is, uh, Kate, she, she goes on these RFR meetings every week. Um, I think every week or every two weeks. And, um, they're just meant for people recovering. You from might want to elaborate right? on what the acronym is for. Oh yeah, yeah. RFR recovering from religion. Yes. So, um, and they have these, you know, group sessions where people are being open and honest and sharing about, you know, there are a lot, a lot of traumatic experiences in being in the church and hmm. they get a lot of engagement, right? Hmm. You know, I think, I think, you know, people out there don't need to feel alone in feeling like, you know, if you need to get things off your chest, there are ways to do that. And hmm. you can do that here. You can do that anywhere. Hmm. Um, I'm beginning to think even as we bring in this episode to the close, I know as a believer, we used to look down as evangelicals on the Catholic church, but the idea of them having a designated person like a priest that would hear confession was probably a better model mm -hmm. than what because you know you weren't going into the confession booth yeah. and right. there was a certain amount of anonymity there mm -hmm. too i guess and and you weren't going there and having the priest like laugh at you i'd imagine after you could like brady's experience that's horrifying mm -hmm. um and i'd imagine you sit in a confession booth and you could just share your thing and i don't know the priest is supposed to be professional and then you get up and go about your business you don't have to like i don't know so I, I i'm not saying that it's you know it's all bs but i'm just saying like as it's funny we used to always thumb our nose up at the at the catholic church and they actually systematized it in some way right yeah we we would criticize that you know the priest had no right to forgive sins right yeah as pro as, as good protestants but um but that there was some psychological like getting it the, the part about getting it off your chest You're getting off your they chest got that part maybe hmm. they yeah. did a better job with that maybe i guess huh i don't know yeah it, you know there, and there's a whole psychological study about you know what uh the impact of keeping lots of secrets does right a lot you know mm -hmm. we're talking about shame and self-hatred and keeping all this stuff inside um you know, and I bet you the majority of this stuff is, you know, if anybody heard it, if a therapist heard it, they'd be like, you know, there's nothing wrong with you, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. You're not, you're not some abnormality. You're not, you know, a, a you know, a vessel to be uh, subjected to, you know, some wrath of any kind. Um, there's a lot. I of... wonder what the female version of this is because everything we've been talking about largely has been from a a male perspective um mm -hmm. uh, it'd be interesting mm. i'm yeah. sure that their experience mirrors ours in some ways but maybe a right. different experience too you know mm -hmm. um that's just me just like just thinking out loud on some level but yeah i just i know a lot about purity culture and accountability groups for men mm. but um i know they had women versions of some of those things mm -hmm. but i'm sure there's a found expression differently so, I don't know. Yeah, like, so, you know, the, the, whatever path to, you know, whether you're still in the in a church, right? I, you know, there is a way to heal from all this, right? The, the, there, is, there are steps you can take. And whatever that path is, that path of recovery or the path of healing, 
I think, you know, is, is going to largely depend, I think, on, on how safe people are going to feel, how you are going to feel with yourself, mm -hmm. with whoever you're, you know, whether you're seeing a therapist, whoever you're getting community. The, the, the path of healing is, is nothing like, you know, the, the faith structures that we had, right? It, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, at, at least that's, that's, how, how I, I perceive it, right? Because in this constant struggle of faith, you know, you you are trying to remember things about God and the gospel and whatever doctrinal thing that, you know, you have, as well as stories that you have to tell yourself, you know, some of which can be, can work, right, mm -hmm. from a psychological perspective. But, um, but I would put a lot of money on it. <laughs> that people who were in the church, right, who just were to go through the list that we just went through and really examine yourself that, you know, that there's no way that you have experience, you have trauma in your life that you don't know about. Hmm. Um, I think that percentage of 37%, right, that's hmm. the conservative number from the survey. I'm putting it up there at 90. I don't, so, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be someone who you know, once again, I, I, I want to go where the science goes. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you could really put a, a clinical test out there, a clinical mm -hmm. survey structured in the most ideal, perfect way, I think that number is is mm -hmm. much, much higher than, 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 than you think. Yeah. Um, I wonder to what degree that number is affected too by those who, who deconverted and deconstructed because yeah. the answers that those people give like, I think I said this at the beginning, I had a, a Christian brother who told me he doesn't see the psychological harm that the faith is doing, right. but that's because he's still in it. Mm -hmm. And so he wouldn't report, he wouldn't answer certain questions in a way that would give off a red flag. It would take, I think, leaving to, to give those kinds of responses, I think. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I... Well, any trauma you know, I, that you're experiencing psychologically, you would necessarily blame that on yourself if you're a christian yeah. not on god yeah so the faith in god would not be to blame for the trauma mm -hmm. it would all be your misinterpretation of the passages you know right. because what you're supposed to love the lord so if you're afraid of god even mm -hmm. though the text does com commend you to serve mm -hmm. him with trembling and fear mm -hmm. somehow they emphasize the love part more than the trembling and fear right. part so I don't know. Yeah. They seem yeah. to be mutually incompatible and exclusive right. in a sense, but mm -hmm. whatever. Right. I'm not getting into that with anybody in the comment section. <laughs> <laughs> it's not happening. You but, know, and I, and I might I might take a shot to any person in particular. I'm just saying, like, I, I'm not gonna get dragged into the debate about can mm -hmm. you with trembling and fear love somebody with all of your heart? Yeah. Like, I don't know. It, yeah, I guess and, it's and, one of those categories that's unique to God, right? Again, you know, you, you know, just think back to the example I gave about my childhood, right, and hmm. uh, how that relate related to it. it it's 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 it, it took, like I said, it took me twenty years to kind of go through that, and there's no way that I could have seen it being in there. But yeah. um, I know that a lot of that hard work and processing that I had to do with my therapist and myself individually, these insights, like these insights, you'll be surprised at how these insights will man like will bubble up. Mm -hmm. And as long as you just put in the time, mm -hmm. right. I think that there's no better way of healing than knowing that if you just do something, there will be an outcome. And mm. that outcome is guaranteed to happen. Um, and it's most the most ideal if you can do it with a professional, right? Professional who will respect your privacy, who will listen to what you say, who will take what you say seriously. Um, you know, you don't have any any reason to shame, feel ashamed or have any self-hatred in, in that room. Mm. Uh will foster any kind of negative thing about that. It, it it's it's gonna be taking you seriously, which is not what mm. we're used to. <laughs> we're not yeah. used to that. Yeah. We're not used to that mm. in, in that way. So 
Um, hmm. So that that's that's my you know I, I'm not a I'm not a clinical psychologist, but I think I think that I, I can tell you for the last twelve years that hmm. that has really worked itself out and it's continued to work itself out, and that healing is continuing to happening. So, and you feel um, I guess the the skeptical portion of this presentation is going to be essentially you feel like that was a better solution for the traumas that you'd experienced as a human being than yeah. than religion right i mean i don't yeah. want to say it for you but that's the that's the skeptical part of it right yeah yeah absolutely uh i i think uh to be the nicest i can to religion mm. uh religion wasn't good for me mm. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, hmm. I don't think I and I don't think religion is good for most people. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe if you're sometimes, I, I don't want to be harsh, but you know, if if for some reason you don't have a lot of empathy, <laughs> then right, I think, right, because so I, I had those I, people on my Facebook I, page who, right, before before Jesus, they were in gangs, they were hurting people, right. they were using people, they were this, that, and the third. Was religion good for them? Well, in some ways, it it did give them. It helped, it helped right. them to value themselves and value other human beings in a way that they weren't doing before. So mm -hmm. I think religion does do that good for those people who, like you said, if they lacked empathy, if they right. lacked, you know, positive self-image in, in, in some ways. They just needed to run into the, 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 the thug on high. <laughs> <laughs> they were they were thugging, thugging out. And then when they ran into a, the biggest thug of them all, then they were like, all right, you know, like the dog, he ducked his tail and he said, all right, all right, I'm going to submit to the thug on high. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. You, you kind of, you often wonder like how much, what does conversion really mean? Mm. Right. Right. It, it, does it really mean conversion? Mm. Right. Or are we just, are, are we, you know, like in the analogy of uh, my experience, I felt mm. safety in being in an abusive relationship, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So we, we, th th that's the thing. We, I, I think as human beings, we will latch onto, if, if religion becomes a part of your life, I think mm. you will latch onto the things that have a function mm -hmm. in your psychology. Yeah. And for me, that was, uh, that was one of the unfortunate ones. Uh, it was a weird know, like comfort has, food, I guess. That weird, yeah, it was a weird comfort food. So I think that's part of what, um, what this can be is to maybe to challenge people to maybe assess, mm -hmm. even if you need help doing it, assess how religion is functioning in your psychology. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. that is what it's doing. Yeah. It's functioning in our society, but first by functioning in individual psychologies of, of, of people. And mm -hmm. you can get two Christians side by side at the same church, reading the same Bible, hearing the same preaching. And the religion could be functioning different in both of those people's psychology. Yeah. Maybe doing something for you that you need, something you're getting out of it that the person beside you is not getting that they're getting something different. Yeah. I remember seeing some brothers that were that hadn't their their father had abandoned them or whatever. And they seemingly wanted the, you know, the paternal kind of guidance of a father on, on high. And for me, my father was way too present and way too overlording. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was actually kind of like on that, you know, you get, you understand where I was going yeah. with this. So what so it was doing for them, it wasn't doing for you. you it was no, something. the same, it was the same thing, but it was just like a totally different effect on mm -hmm. me than it did for them. For them, they were like, I need that structure and the, the, the guy telling me what to do and whatever. Mm -hmm. And me, mm -hmm. I'm like, God dealt with that my entire life growing up. Yeah, right. I kind of am not yeah, too you're, keen you're on done. that, you know? Mm. Yeah. 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 Good stuff. This is good stuff. Al, thank you for putting this together and for, for walking us through this. My pleasure. Um, in the comments, yeah, you guys can be, if you haven't already, uh, be letting us know those, those nine points we went to, nine points of the way trauma shows up. Um, you don't have to say any more than you want to, but if you want to talk mm -hmm. about how you can see that that happening in your own life i think it may help some people in the uh in the chat and uh also like we said this is a place where people can come and find community even though it's uh it's online and it's you know you get in where you fit in but we definitely hope you guys meet a friend keep a friend encourage each other because uh yeah it's 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 difficult to unbecome something that you took decades becoming and mm -hmm. um so yeah but thank you guys for your time we'll see you in the chat much love